Submission Radio 1 2. It's May 10th. I'm Dennis Skradov. I'm here with Kasper Rozalowski. Big, big show and lots of exciting guests. Absolutely. Big one for you today, guys. We've got a bunch of guests. Uh, starting the show, we're going to have none other than from Greg Jackson's John the Magician Dodson. He's going to be on the show. Uh, then we're going to be talking to Nate Diaz's manager, Mike Kogan, on all things Nate Diaz. What exactly is happening with those rankings? Uh, then we've got obviously UFC 172 is a couple of weeks behind us. Uh, we're going to be talking to John Hackleman, who is obviously Glover Teixeira and Chuck Liddell's longtime trainer. We're going to get a complete breakdown from him on UFC 172. And then, Dennis, we've got another big guest. Who else do we have? Yeah, well, news came out that Chad Mendes is going to have the next title shot against Jose Aldo. And we've got Chad on the show to discuss what he thinks about this huge rematch. Obviously, you know, Chad, a very sexy man. So we'll have to have a chat to him. Apparently, he's got a bit of an obsession with Tim Tams, which is an Australian treat. So who knows if the interview goes well, we might have to send him a little treat in the mail. Team Alpha Male, guys, always a pleasure to interview. So a very, very big show. Guys, if you want to check us out a little bit later, make sure you tune in to us through Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or, of course, Sexy Little iTunes. Mm, hashtag sexy beast for iTunes and for Chad Mendes. And we're also going to be talking about Conor McGregor. That's another fun little one. Um, but as we said, big show, John Dodson coming up first. And of course, next week, uh, we will be doing some stuff with EA UFC. So look out for, for that on the channel. We'll be talking to the, the producers there. There's a media only event and, uh, your boys, your pals, submission radio will be there. So make sure to let us know what questions you want asked and what you want to know about the EA UFC game. Jump on our Twitter. It's submission a u s. Link us some questions. Tell us what you want to know, and uh, we will do our best to ask those questions. That's right, guys. And don't forget subscribe to our YouTube channel, YouTube slash Submission Radio AU. A lot of great content coming onto it next week, including some huge guests next week. So you got a lot of stuff to look forward to from Submission Radio, and obviously four guests on the show today. So if you have, if you don't have very much time to listen to the full show, the order is as Casper said: John Dodson, Mike Kogan, John Hackleman, and then Chad Mendes. So feel free to skip through and skim through to the interview that you'd like to listen to next. Absolutely. And uh, while we can't announce them just yet, subscribe. Do yourself a favor and subscribe to the channel because we do have some massive guests next week and it's going to be a really fun show, as is, of course, this show. Dennis, what do you think? I think we're almost upon the time where we need our first guest on the show. Yeah, I think the bad phone is about to ring, Cass, and I'm very excited. I'm excited about this guy as well. Uh, he's got a big fight coming up and uh, I can't wait to chat to him. Uh, who have we got, Dennis? He is the bantamweight winner of The Ultimate Fighter. Ladies and gentlemen, we have the magician. We have John Dodson on Submission Radio. John, welcome to Submission Radio. Well, thank you for having me on. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. Now, we'll get right into it, John. Last time we saw you, you knocked out uh, Daryl Montague in the first round. We haven't had enough John Dodson in our lives. Why the long layoff? Uh, I had a knee injury. I tore my ACL and MCL at the same time, getting ready to fight uh, Scott Georgeson. Wow. And it was like four days before I actually had a fight on. Yeah, we remember that. That's 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 a pretty big deal. Uh, how is the knee? And uh, are you going to be like the $6 million man in the sense that you'll be better than before when you come back? Well, I'm hoping so because if not, all this training has been for nothing. <laughs> yeah, well, speaking of the training, how's it going? Obviously, you have a very tough fight against uh, John Moraga on June 7th at UFC Fight Night, Henderson versus Kabulov. Um, how's the training going for the big fight? Well, it's been going great. I've been making sure uh, I'm getting on my striking game, making sure my knee is okay, and throwing a lot more kicks, which is, I'm trying to implement more. And everyone's talking about my jiu-jitsu game, so I'm thinking about displaying it a little here, right here on this side. Now, uh, with, with ACLs, they are really tricky. Obviously, GSP blew out his. Carlos Condit went down with, with his. Um, how How is yours feeling? You know, so Athletes really react differently to ACL surgeries and when they come back. How, how's yours going so far? Oh, it feels great. It feels like bad year. I've been trying to do some new stunts by doing like double back floats and double front floats. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, yeah, other than that, it doesn't really bother me too much. Wow, it just made a, a lot of Australians feel bad because, you know, some of us can barely do one flip. And not even backwards, just forwards, <laughs> off a diving board into a pool. But hey, I was gonna, I was gonna ask you, John, um, with, with this whole knee yeah, injury, with, with this whole knee injury thing, you know, there's a lot of knee injuries happening recently in MMA, a lot more than there used to be. What do you attribute that to? How did your injury occur? And do you think it's something to do with the, tr the hard training these days? 
I'll tell you the truth, mine was just a freak accident. I slipped in my knee pop. Like, there's nothing really behind it, yeah. Mm, uh, with everyone else's knee injuries, there's probably uh, can attribute to them work out hard, but you know what I'm talking about? Mine, mine was just like a, I literally fell on my butt and my knee popped out. Wow. I was so like, what the hell? So there's no, there's, no, freaking out. there's no cool knee injury story there. Nah. -uh. <laughs> I wish it was, because then it make it so much. It make it seem, make me seem so much cooler and tougher <laughs> if that actually happened. Yeah, I wish there was a few sharks involved and stuff like that. But that's okay. Um, you've already fought John Moraga before in 2011, and you did beat him by unanimous decision. Uh, why do you think you've been chosen to fight him again? Well, because he just came off of a title. Well, he fought for the title and then came off of a very close decision against uh, Dustin Ortiz, and since. Since Demetri Johnson already has a new opponent, uh, opponent lined up for his title fight, or his title offense, I should say. They just want to make sure I can step up to the plate and see if I can be the next contender or, or if he's going to replace me in it. Is it. Is it tough fighting somebody again that you've already beaten? Is it tough getting mo motivated for the training as a fighter? No, nah, because for me, <laughs> he's a brand new fighter. It's a different, it's a different person than I fought the first time. So yeah. him fought in 2011 after the Dominican Republic John Morocco, and now this is the UFC one. I get to see <laughs> the new style, the new fight, like the new potential that you just get bring, you know? And yeah. he's a new threat. Back then, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't knocking people out. He was more of a wrestling submission, and now he's starting to step up his striking game, and he's, and he's knocking out people a lot more. I feel like John Moraga has like an action figure, and back then you have the D Dominican Republic version, and now you've got like the new fancy UFC version with fancy gloves. Sounds yeah. good. <laughs> yeah, you have to. You, gotta, you can't think somebody would be the exact same type of person. Like you get like all these new cars and stuff like that. You can't have like the '96 version of a of Camry versus uh, two, the 2014 the 2014 version of a Camry because one's gonna be way better than the other one. More rumor, roomier, and like more comfortable to be to be around. And don't forget leather seats. Um, <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and parking seats and all the stuff that are coming in Lexus. Yeah. yeah and if, change them. if you're backing up, it beeps at you and like tells you, hey, now, <laughs> slow down, guy. <laughs> but um, do you think with rematches, is do you think they're easier because you've already felt out your opponent or harder because they've had a chance to do the same with you? Uh, harder because you have to come up with new tactics and new styles to go ahead and beat them. You can't really sit there and sit there and be like, oh, if I beat this guy, I can just do the exact same thing because it's not the exact same fight. So, uh, speaking of what you're going to be doing, obviously you mentioned you, you do, you're throwing a lot of more kicks and training. Can you tell us a little bit about what your game plan is going into this fight? Yeah, I'm going to run up, I'm going to run out there, touch his glove, and hit him with the left hand as hard as I can. <laughs> if he doesn't go down, I'm going to kick him. I just want to go home. I'm fighting my hometown, so... I got to put on um, like a semi show, but at the exact same time, I don't want to get beat up and battered to go um, to too bad, so I can't, can't go hang out with my friends afterwards. That's exactly right. And you know, tell us about fighting in your hometown. Uh, how, how do you? A lot of fighters are different. Do you feel pressure fighting in your hometown, or, or do you relish it and you, you love it? You're just going to eat it up and you know go for a good performance. Well, I relish it, man. I can't wait. Like I love fighting in front of thousands of fans, but. It's thousands of people that I've seen practically every day. Like, I see all these people and they don't even know who I am. I just, like, walk, like, kind of mosey around. And this gives me a chance and opportunity to showcase, like, my skills and my, um, how, the reason why the UFC thinks I'm number one contender in that weight class. And um, just speaking on that, fighting in your hometown, are you like Rocky when, you, when you're jogging down the road? Does, like, a green grocer throw you an apple and you go, come on, John, you know, win, win this one and... People, kids are right, jogging after you as you jog down the street. Is that what's going on? No, nah, when I jog down the street, I get nothing but dogs and like I get snakes chasing after me and stuff like that. Because <laughs> 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 I'm like I'm mostly in the foothills, I'm like in the mountains where I'm over that. You know, so I don't think any really kids are going to be following me out there. <laughs> so the important question is: Will there be any snakes coming to the event? I hope not. <laughs> you know I'm I'm tiny, right? He's gonna probably think I'm a rat. <laughs> <laughs> they'll they'll make a movie based on it, and it'll be uh, starring Samuel L. Jackson playing John Dodson. It'll be snakes in a cage. <laughs> <laughs> there are snakes in the cage. <laughs> 
sick of these motherfucking snakes in this motherfucking UFC. <laughs> <laughs> Now, how far would you say you are from a rematch against uh, Demetrius Johnson? Depends on how this fight goes. And if I can win this decisively by finishing with either submission or knockout, I'll, I'm guessing pretty close. But if not, if I go to a decision, I need a little bit more time and figure out what I need to work on. Well, that, that's a very humble answer, and it's very inter interesting as well. Speaking of um, Demetrius, obviously you did fight him. Uh, last year in January, you did lose. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what went wrong in that fight? And also, how long did that fight linger in your head afterwards? I still lingers in my head afterwards, to tell you the truth. And right now, I still think that I won the first three rounds. I dropped in the first, dropped in the second, I controlled the third, and then I lost the fourth and fifth. But uh, it's my own fault because I watched me hit him, I watched him fall, and I watched me lose the fight because I just let it slip out of my hand. Every single time I wanted to jump on him, I did it. I'm paying the price for it now by not having a USC gold around my legs. Mm. Uh, I'm missing that killer instinct that I, I had in my all my other fights when I wanted to get Demetrius Johnson. That gave me way too much respect. Yeah, you mentioned you mentioned the killer instinct. What what would you say would be the biggest thing you learned from that fight? Kill everybody I will we'll come across now. <laughs> I'm sure they will have no reason to go to decision. And uh, speaking of Demetrius, obviously, you know, he's had some impressive defenses lately. How do you think he's coming along as a fighter? He's he's beginning to finish his opponents. Do you see much of, a, of an evolution in Demetrius since you fought him last? I've seen you know, him, like, go ahead and start tapping out and knocking out everybody. It's kind of cool to see him but to actually start using some power and becoming a fan favorite. So now whenever I fight him again, it gives, it, uh, gives us a little bit more hype to see who's going to knock out who. Or who's going to finish you? Well, it's something that we're definitely seeing in the flyweight division, which is, you know, really throwing out that stereotype of in, out the window where, you know, only heavyweights and high weight classes, you know, get the knockouts. But um, speaking of high weight classes, when you won the Ultimate Fighter 14, you obviously beat TJ Dillashaw. Uh, you got the TKO. Now, TJ is obviously still in bantamweight, and he's getting the title shot, uh, you know, against Henan Barrow, UFC 173. Uh, is it difficult seeing TJ get the title shot considering that you've already beat him? No, not really. So, one, I'm not in my weight class, but if he wins, I'm definitely thinking that I should go up. Yeah, well, that's... I'll beat him once, and I'll definitely like to go for him for that title, too. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, I guess that's sort of a funny funny thing, isn't it? How would you feel about going up to bantamweight if TJ does win? Would Do you think um, that you two would have another great rematch? Do you think you could possibly beat him again? So I'll try my best. Like, I can't sit there and say I can because it's a fight game. It's the biggest gamble of our lives. You never know where that dice is going to roll, or what punch is going to land, or what knee's going to hit you. He actually try shooting on me, and that's going to be like, the most impressive thing in the world. Now, speaking of impressive, a dream matchup for fans would be a fight between, say, you and Uriah Faber. Uh, would you ever consider fighting Uriah and figuring out a catchweight or moving back up to, you know, bantamweight for the fight? Technically, that wouldn't be a catch rate. But I'll be down to go into the if I fight your right ever. So fast, so quick. Let's see whose speed is faster. Who hits harder? Man, that would be a crazy yeah. fight. I'm just seeing the UFC commercial in my head. I mean, wow. That would be amazing. I hope that happens one day. I would, um, yeah, I would, I would do a little dance if I saw that happen. Um, <laughs> now, let's talk a little bit about uh, your, your time at Jackson's. Now, you've been at Jackson's since 2002. Is that right? And um, tell us a little bit about what it's been like. Obviously, you've been there for, you know, over 10 years now. You've had a relationship with Greg for such a long time. What's your relationship like with Greg? Uh, we're kind of, uh, just like a family mentality. I look up to him and he looks, and he looks to me for any advice that I can help out with any of, with any of the guys. He's like, hey, what do you think we can use on this strategy? So it looks to me like as if I was another coach in the in the I'm just in the gym. And we've got to, if he needs to corner anybody that he wants me to, I'll go out and go do that job. And then when I need to focus on my fight, he lets me sit there and take my time and do whatever I need, do what I need to get prepared. Now, obviously, Greg, you know, he, he's a guy, he's a real genius. He, he, he trains a lot of the best in MMA. He's very good as far as game planning and, game planning and strategies. What, if you could say narrow it down to one thing, what's the biggest and most important thing that Greg's taught you? To be myself. 
and try to be like anyone else and start forming to like certain people's ideas and whatever they have to say. And if they don't like you for who you are, then they can pretty much kick rocks. You know, John, I was always wondering, um, obviously Jackson has such an impressive uh, range of fighters and, you know, Mike Wink, he's always on our show chatting about uh, fighters and who's coming up. But I was just wondering, what's the situation with training? Obviously, you're not going to be doing sparring with guys who are in the light heavyweight, heavyweight division. But if, when you guys do grappling, yes, you, you, still got, you guys still do sparring? At the, um, in those yeah, sure. Yeah, why not? Wow. They might not like sparring with me because I'm faster than they are. <laughs> but the same, thing, the same thing goes for them. I don't like sparring with them because they're heavier than me. They throw heavier punches. I got done messing around with Andre. Like Andre Alaski is making his uh, UFC return uh, for UFC 174, I think. I don't know if it's been confirmed, but yeah, no, I know yeah, he's yeah, missing yeah. sharp. Yep. Yeah. Uh, John, I, I, so I was gonna, I was gonna ask you. That's really, really interesting. And then you guys obviously do grappling together as well, um, no matter what weight class. Is that right? Yep. Um, they can use our speed to help them get better, which is like we can use our strength. That actually body weight kills us to make it and uh, motivate us to stand up and get to new positions and not to be trapped. It's always being in that tough, like being in that what, rock and a hard place. So that's was, what it is for us. That's, that's very, very oh, interesting. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't realize that. So uh, my question to you is obviously um, people are saying that Alistair Overeem's coming over to Jackson's. Are you excited to be working with Alistair? Obviously, like you mentioned, you have a lot of speed, but Alistair's got a lot of power. Do you think you can learn a lot from Alistair and vice versa? He could from the team. I think you can learn a lot from the team. If I'm trying to train with them, uh, I'm trying not to get punted through the wall. <laughs> <laughs> then that goes for all of us. Um, I was going to so, ask also... I heard he doesn't have like a middle gear. Like, I heard that Alistair was like, he likes to train hard. So if he's trying to train hard some of my size, yeah, I think we're either going to go through the wall or through the ceiling. <laughs> well, yeah, you, if you watch the ream, like, yeah, the, the, there's some pretty... There's a lot of bodies dropping, suffice it to say. Um, move but quickly, I was gonna move quickly, John. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna ask you, um, as far as our, you and Arlovsky, just just the mental matchup picture in in our heads is just crazy. What what was that sparring like against Arlovsky? I just know why he gets mad because I'm so short because he misses. <laughs> <laughs> he's always like, why are you, he's a midget? Why are you so fast? I was like, because you're gonna hit me and it's gonna hurt. And he goes, ah, just stay still for two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> well. It yeah, you know, Wink was on our show a couple of weeks ago, and he said Arlovsky has a cool sense of humor. Um, obviously, you've known Arlovsky for a while now. You know, how happy are you that he's back in the UFC and has another shot at big, you know, in one of the biggest leagues in MMA? Yeah, I'm real happy because, like, I, I don't know really say much about Andre, but he, he was one of my favorite fighters of, of all time. Like, in the heavyweight division, because he was so much faster, he was wider than his feet, and I... And he looks smaller than all the other heavyweights. And then when I met him, he looked like an average heavyweight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Andres. Yeah. Andres. Yeah. Go on, sorry. Then no, no, you, you go. I was like, no, Andres is just like a cool person. Like, and the gym is like one of my best friends. Who I always talk to this giant, and he always and he always looks to me to for to help him out with that, like uh, get him ready and motivated to fight uh, to fight and train. Now, um, speaking speaking of friends, uh, I want to talk to you about the Ultimate Fighter. Fighters, you're obviously winning the the fourteenth season of Tough. Fighters often have mixed feelings on the Ultimate Fighter, usually depending on how they were portrayed. You obviously uh, were on Tough fourteen on Team Mayhem and won the show. How was your experience on the Ultimate Fighter? Mm, I think it was a summer camp. Like, I didn't do much. I sat there, just chilled, hung out with a bunch of people, and I got to meet like. I got to hear the cool stories about their lives. The person I still talk to is uh, Marcus Rimmage. That and dude, I like. He's, he's like the brother that I never had, but also never wa really wanted. But we chat, we chat all the time. Like at least like once a, once a week. Um, I was gonna I was gonna say, John, um, with with the Ultimate Fighter, we've had a, with TJ's come on, we had um, Jake come on. They said that. Uh, behind the scenes, um, sometimes certain things happen, certain things get edited to make make it look like certain things are going on that never really happened, or certain people get to be made out in, in a light that they're not really made out in. Um, can you shed some light on what it's actually like being there when they're shooting the show, and what what don't we see as fans watching through the TV? Well, watching through the TV, 
uh, everybody ate all my food. I cooked everything. I cooked the whole time I was with at the house. Like I was a chef. Everyone was, oh, you making you making dinner? I'm like, Dang it! <laughs> Hold on, let me make some more for all y'all too. And I'll just cook all the time. I cook the train, and then we all like I basically kept myself occupied by keeping the house clean. I cleaned all day. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Obviously, obviously oh. mate. I was going to ask you, obviously, Mayhem Miller was in the headlines uh, for all the wrong reasons towards the end of his career, and uh, he was your coach on Ultimate Fighter 14, but, you know, in the Ultimate Fighter 14, he seemed like a very, very good coach and a very good teacher. Uh, what was he like uh, on the show, and what was he like as a coach? Way different than he would ever, you would ever think. He had, uh, I had a, a, a most respect for him. He brought in certain, uh, certain trainers for different aspects, like he rather. Mel Manor for Muay Thai, Danny Perez for boxing. He brought Ryan, uh, Ryan Parsons just like a whole, a whole game plan. Uh, Mayhem was doing Jiu Jitsu, but then uh, Kamal Usman for uh, wrestling. I was like, man, he brought everything that, can pop, that we possibly want from like a coaching staff and gave it to us. So when we wanted to improve like our whole overall game, we wanted to work on things that we were already great at so we can have potential, so we could potentially win the show. He gave that to us. He gave us the people that we wanted to work with. We went with them. If we wanted to hit mates with certain people, we wanted to new, learn new styles. We wanted to brush up on certain things or pick their brain. He get like allowed us. He gave us access to everything that we wanted. Um, so, and uh, what, 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 what what do you what do you think of what's happened to uh, Jason recently? Obviously, he's had a bit of a rough run with things. Um, do you still speak to him? Yeah. What do you think what, about what's happened to him recently? Tell you the truth, man. I don't know what is do. What is this dude's problem? He's probably done lost his mind, but you know, like I'm hoping that he'll figure out what he's missing and what he needs to do to become or get himself back into the UFC or get back into that right limelight because what he's doing right now is not working out for him. Yeah, I think I think Mayhem Miller. He was a fan favorite for so many years. You know, I think a lot of people hope that too. Um, but speaking of a guy who doesn't seem like he has any problems, John Jones. He recently had a big win at UFC 172 over Glover Teixeira. Tell us about the vibe in Jackson, Jackson's leading up to the fight, and then in a contrast after the fight. Well, the vibe at the gym was they had more heavyweights there, so they helping helping John and Travis get ready for the, for their fights, and you know, they were always trying to make sure that John was ready, and trying to help him get ready for every certain little things. Even with all the mayhem that was going on with him losing his cat and stuff like that, it's kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was I was gonna say, you know, Mike Wickle John came on the show and said that a lot of the unorthodox techniques that we see John uh, Jones do are based on Campo karate uh, things that he that he's been trying to enforce with his fighters for a long time, but not that many people want to try them. You're obviously one of the best athletes at Jackson's. You can do amazing things. How much of those techniques are you going to utilize? In, in your fighting game? I use it all the time. I just, I've never been able to jump on the opportunity to execute them in like an actual fight. When you're fighting, you always go back to your basics and you go back to what you're, well, pretty much just good at. I know that sounds bad, but like, that's what we always fall back to. You go back to everything that you were taught in the beginning. And that's what I was always taught, just go back to your day, go back to my basics and go back to boxing. Now, John, we're going to do something. We're going to ask you a few questions. Uh, this is what we call the Submission Radio Tap Out Round. It is world-renowned, or at least we hope it is. Uh, basically, what we do, we fire off a bunch of questions. It's kind of like word association. We, you want to answer them pretty much as quick as you can, and uh, this is the getting to know you round. Are you ready? Okay. All right, so we've picked your next walkout song, and you have to choose from War, Why Can't We Be Friends, Barry White, can't get enough of your love, babe. Or Iggy Azalea Fancy. Which do you choose? Why can't we be friends? <laughs> John, uh, what's the best thing about working at Chuck E. Cheese? Free pizza. Now, tag team MMA fight, and you have three magicians to choose from. Who do you choose to go against, and who's in your corner? Now, your choices are David Blaine, David Copperfield, and Penn Gillette from uh, Penn & Teller. David Blaine, because one, he'll tell me to go and do some random stuff, and I'll hold my pee and make sure I can uh, utilize it as my anger 
to be the to be my opponent. <laughs> and seeing as your nickname is magician, can you actually do a trick? I put people to sleep. Hey, that's a good one. <laughs> uh, Coach Wink says that you're the biggest practical joker in Jackson's. Tell us about the biggest prank you've played on somebody there. So, we actually did to the biggest prank we did. We actually took somebody's car and and pretended like we stole it. No, we can't really say their names because they'd be very upset. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, we took the car and we basically just literally just stole it and moved it to and took it to the house. But he didn't come find it, so he was running around looking for it. And then the cops that the, the cops that helped us uh, move this vehicle to his house, <laughs> you me... know, reported it at his own house. Like, oh, you're you're done. You just forgot your car at your own place. <laughs> let Let me ask like, you, you something. Your own let, let me ask you something. So this story was the car a cat. And was the person John Jones by any chance? <laughs> no, the cat was John. The car belonged to somebody else, and I can't, I'm not going to say his name uh, ever on radio because he's more vindictive about uh, seeking revenge on people. Okay. And he's worse at practical jokes than I am. So I was like, absolutely not. <laughs> wow. Okay. So hide your car keys from John. Now, do you ever run through the rooftops of Albuquerque <laughs> with a mask on, jumping over buildings and doing flips like a superhero? Well. I can't run through the uh, the sound. Uh, can't run through the city with masks because uh, we have this like shooting thing going on over here in New Mexico, and I, I don't want to be seen like a bank robber. But I do go around doing flips off of things because we have a professional parkour team here, and uh, I train with them to get ready for my most small fight. Okay. I don't even know why we asked. We, we were pretty much sure that you would anyway. It, it was pretty much a given. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's karaoke night in Jackson's MMA, and the theme is duets. Uh, what are you singing? Who do you pick to sing with you? And which duo are you going against? Hmm. The person I'm singing with is Cal. Oh, actually, the person I'm singing with is Michelle Watterson. And the, people I'm going, the duo that I'm going to go against is Cowboy and Leonard Garcia. All right, nice. Now, have you ever told a girl you're a, you're a flyweight and try to work the name of the division into a pickup line? No, I, I always use just my uh, I use my ethnicity. I tell people I'm a flagger, a flagger, and they're always like, "What the hell is that?" It's like Filipino and black. And if you really want to understand it, you can fill in this nigga all you want, and it works. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, if you were in the heavyweight division, who would you want to fight? All of them. Because I could knock out every single one of them with it, since they don't have to really worry about uh, footwork or anything else. They just sit there and walk you, to, walk you down and punch you. Look at Roy Nelson. He knocked that little dog, but with his head down, hands down, and his hips and just swung it on. I want to be able to do that. If you were a painting, what kind of frame would you have? An oak wood frame. So it's nice and heavy for this light picture that will be up there. Mm -hmm, oak wood. Yeah, that's a good one. We thought that question would stump you, but it seems like you, you really thought that one out. <laughs> Here's one for you. Do you Google yourself? And if so, how often? Uh, I really don't Google myself. I only Google myself when people tell me that they find something funny about me. Awesome. Now, finish the sentence for us. No one knows that I... have a room full of comics and have nothing but video games and toys in my room. I'm nice. a little kid. Let's be Respect. friends. Let's be friends. <laughs> uh, if your career finished tomorrow, what is the biggest highlight thus far? Uh, the biggest highlight thus far is I guess the fight main event against Dimitri Trishasa for a title fight. And 7.7 million people saw me be awesome. That's right, guys. So hopefully, and hopefully you'll have another one very soon in the future, guys. This is, he is John Dodson. Follow him at John Dodson MMA on Twitter, and make sure to check out June seventh card UFC Fight Night Henderson versus Kabilov. It's going to be an amazing event, and we'll sure to have John on again to discuss his fight afterwards. John, it's been a pleasure. The interview went too quickly. I know. I wish we could spend a little more time together. Wow. I know, we, we, we miss you already, but that's okay, we'll have you on in the future. <laughs> Good luck in your fight, and uh, I'm sure we'll be talking to you as the winner in in a few months. Okay, I'm down. Always. You're very similar to think that I'm already going to win. Yep. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. We're, we're, we're psychics like that. John, thanks so much for coming on the show. We'll, uh, we'll speak to you soon and good luck in the fight. Oh, thank you, guys. And I can't wait to come back on. John Dodson, such a nice guy, the magician, you know, what an awesome nickname and definitely one of the more gifted athletes in the UFC. But uh, moving on to topics that have been happening in the UFC this week, a hot topic has been Nate Diaz being taken off the fighter rankings by Dana White and the UFC. Yeah, you know, it's it's a really interesting thing that's basically happened. A lot of people are in uproar as far as Nick, uh, Nate Diaz being taken off those rankings. Um, as, as far as some of our thoughts, I think with Nate Diaz, you know, the guy, the guy's basically refusing to fight, and I mean, at the end of the day, that's his choice, but there's a bit of a difference between a guy like Anthony Pettis or TJ Grant, you know, those guys are injured, they can't fight, they're not necessarily refusing to, um, so I guess that's, that's the reason why they're still in the rankings, but the thing about the rankings is, it's a way to promote fighters, if you've got the number 10 label on you, then, you know, that's, that's a better way to sell, sell the fighter, when you can say, this is the number 10 guy versus the number 6 guy, and I think in this sense, if, if Nate Diaz is holding that spot hostage and refusing to fight, I mean, he, he may refuse to fight for the next 50 years, we don't know that, so I think as, as far as the UFC doing that, I mean, it's very hard to blame them, what do you think, Dennis? Could you imagine that, Nate Diaz coming back at the ripe age of 60 or 70 in 50 years' time? to regain his uh, fifth ranking in the UFC rankings, <laughs> take on the champion. Hey, man, I, you know what? I absolutely agree with you. You know, it is it is UFC's ranking after all. I think a lot of people are up in arms about it because the rankings are pretty sus as is. I don't think people really mm. respect the rankings, and I think it doesn't really do much for the rankings, but I think it might be UFC sort of calling Nate's bluff and saying, hey, if you're not planning on returning, then we might as well take you off the rankings. And maybe it's a little bit of a ploy in a way to get Nate to uh, re-sign or uh, recommit to a fight sooner. But either way, I'm very excited uh, about our next guest, Cass, who is Mike Kogan, who is Nate uh, Diaz's manager and who can shed some light on the situation for us. And I think he's ready on the Batmobile, on the Bat phone, uh, ready to go for the next interview. All right, guys, our next guest on the show manages such clients as King Mo, Roy Nelson, and Nate Diaz. He is none other than Mike Kogan. Mike, welcome to Submission Radio. Hi, thank you. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you on there. Um, now, we wanted to find out a little bit on your background. You've been in the managing game since 2000. How exactly did you get into the gig? Uh, I started managing Hoyce Gracie in 2000. I met him at the seminar, and um, I don't know, we struck a conversation, decided that we we're going to work together, and, um, you know, that's how I started. Oh, awesome, Mike. And um, obviously, you know, you're a big MMA fan. What were you doing before you were a manager? When you met Hoist, what was your career then? Um, me and my partner owned a computer business in, uh, in the States. Ah, cool. Okay. Now, you also work for a company very well known to fight fans, K1. Uh, tell us a bit about that. What was that like? Um, it was uh, it was good. You know, I, I, I got to meet a lot of people. Um, I got to see the um, flip side of uh, the business from the promoter standpoint. Um, I got to learn about, you know, how the TV deals function and how the events are put together and you know, it, just, it, was, it was a great experience, and I got to meet, you know, a ton of people. So it was, it was, I was, it was pretty good. You know, it's sad that uh, they ended up folding, but, mm. you know, it is what it is. And, um, you know, Mike, you do sound like a businessman. Um, from your thoughts, you know, as a businessman, what do you think some of the issues were that, um, you know, caused K1 to close? Obviously, it was a great company. Yeah, I think, I think probably the, 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 the two key issues with K1 were that the people that were put in charge of running it have never actually built anything from scratch. So they had very little idea how things would operate when you are expanding into new markets because they just never really built anything from scratch. They took over K1 when it was at its peak. Um, so it made it very challenging to work with them in expanding K1 throughout the world um, because Every new market, when you step in, you have to yield and you have to make concessions. And they just weren't willing to do it because they just, they judged everything by the way things were in Japan. And, you know, I constantly put it hazard there and try to explain that in Japan, K1 is already an established brand and it's popular. Here, we're just breaking new ground, so we need to, you know, yield to certain things. That was uh, one. And then the other one was just, um, 
a lack of trust in the abilities of others in the markets in which they're going, um, everything they did to try to impose the way things were in Japan and the way things were done in Japan, and, you know, the world doesn't operate that way. I mean, if, uh, if you look at successful companies that are that have come out of Japan that have expanded worldwide, they have always hired top executives in the countries in which they were expanding and let them kind of guide the vision of the company, but mm-hmm. in the format in which is more suitable for the for the culture and you know and just the way business is done in a country in which they're in. You know what I mean? Like Toyota doesn't come to U.S. and appoint a Japanese executive at the top and then he runs everything the way things are in Japan. They hire mm-hmm. an American guy and they say okay, you understand your country, now we're going to explain to you our vision, you translate it into your language and then apply it and expand. And K1 wasn't willing to do it. So everything was done their way and that created a slew of issues. That's actually, yeah, those are really good points. Um, now, after you, after, K, uh, after you stopped working with K1, uh, you went back to managing, you, you came back from your break. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about your fighters. Obviously, your roster of fighters that you manage include names as, such as King Mo, Roy Nelson, Hoist Gracie, Nate Diaz. The biggest thing in, that all those guys have in common is that they're all really big personalities. Uh, you can't, can't call any of these guys boring. What is it about these types of fighters that makes you want to manage them? And is it a conscious choice by you or is it just a big coincidence? Well, it's not a matter of what makes me want to manage somebody. It's just a matter of uh, talking to the fighter, big or small. It makes no difference to me. I mean, to me, all my guys are the same. I, I treat everybody the same, whether you're the smallest guy fighting on the undercard or you're, or you're a big star. It makes no difference to me. Um, but I have a working relationship with people, and when I meet, meet a fighter, and I talk to them, if we click and, and um, you know, our visions are the same, uh, then we work together. And if we don't, then we don't work together. Um, it's just that simple. And a lot of times um, um, in my business, um, you become almost like a yes man. You just kind of like a glorified secretary. And you know, that's just not what I do. You know, to me... Um, if you work with me, it's because there's something that I bring to the table. So you listen to me, I listen to you, we work together, and we achieve the same goal. Um, and a lot of times, you know, if, if that's not the case, and if the fighter and I don't see eye to eye, then, then we don't work together. Mm. And when you said... Um... But that's the key factor. That's the key factor to me. You know what I mean? It's like um, um, if, if I go to a doctor's office because I'm sick... I don't argue with a doctor over his diagnosis, right? And tell him, well, mm. I think you're wrong. I, mean, I just take his word for it. Otherwise, I just go find another doctor if I don't believe what he's saying. So it's kind of similar here. You know what I mean? I have to be able to have the same vision for my guys um, as, as uh, and we both have to be on the same page and then we, you know, we, we go from there. And what exactly do you look for? Like you said, uh, you said, you know, if if you click, what when you're speaking to a fighter and he says certain things or she says certain things, what are sort of key points for you that make you go, okay, you know, I can I can work with this person? Well, initially, you know, you work with everybody. I mean, it's it's you know, I, I a lot of times I just talk to them and I see what their expectations are, you know, and what they see. And I've been doing this for a long time, so I kind of I can give them a pretty good understanding of how things are going to go and what they have to do and what I'll have to do, uh, you know, to get to the next level. And if we see eye to eye, then great. And if they say, well, you know, I think you're, you're selling me short or, you know, whatever, I think I'm worth more or I'm worth less or, you know, whatever, then I guess we don't see eye to eye. Um, and that's not to say that I'm unyielding or, you know, it's my way or no way. But we have to have a basic understanding of how things are. Um, so, you know, there are certain times where things just have to be done a certain way. Um, and if we just butt heads all the time, then I guess, you know, it's not working out. But initially, it's just a matter of just being honest and upfront. I mean, when you do it for a long time, you kind of, you can kind of tell, you know, where the fighter is at the time when you're, when you're talking to them at what stage of their career. So it's up to you to give them a, a fair assessment of what, you know, the next year or, or maybe even two years are going to look like. And if, uh, 
they don't feel that, you know, if they feel like you're selling them short, then, you know, maybe they need to find somebody else sometimes. But one thing I don't do is over-exaggerate or oversell or promise people something that I know for a fact I will never be able to deliver. So that allows me to um, to have a longer-term relationship with my guys um, and, and build a sense of loyalty and friendship. I mean, all the guys that I manage are my friends. You know what I mean? We're friends. We're, we're buddies. We talk about families and personal issues and those are all kinds of stuff. You know what I mean? It's not just about dollars and cents. That's why when people call them clients, I kind of hate it. I'm like, they're not really my clients. They're just, you know, it's just a group of guys that all work together for a common goal. Very good answer, Mike. And um, one of your good friends slash clients, um, I don't, I'm not sure what to call him, so I'll call him both, Roy Nelson. Now, this guy is one of the more interesting personalities in MMA, obviously, as a manager, um, you want to let him be himself. You want to let him do what he wants to do. But at the same time, a part of a part of your mind also wants to, you know, see him make as much money as he can while he's in the business, um, have the best relationships he can with sponsors. Uh, Dana White, you know, he's always complaining about Roy's look and Roy's attitude. How hard is it, you know, to sort of manage Roy with, you know, letting him being himself? Well, here's the thing. I don't actually manage Roy. Uh, Roy is managed by his wife, um, Jesse. Uh, I'm friends with Roy, so I've helped him out when I could and, uh, and give him some advice and what have you. But I don't manage him, so I don't really feel comfortable about talking about it. But one thing I will tell you is no matter what Dana White says about Roy Nelson, um, the fans love him, and he's still in the UFC, so that's all that matters. Yeah, I, I was going to say, just uh, as far as Roy goes, seems like Roy's just a genuine, honest guy who, you know, doesn't really let the pressures of the world's toughest sport to get him. And I think, you know, maybe Dana White, you know, there's a few misunderstandings. Um, I wanted to ask you about one of your other, I guess, let's say friends, Nate Diaz. He's been on the news a lot recently. His last fight against Gray Maynard it was, you know, fantastic performance where he really put it to Gray in a brutal display. Biggest story coming out of that fight, though, was that Nate apparently, allegedly only getting paid 15000 to show and 15000 to win. Gray, meanwhile, was getting 45000 to show. People made a lot of big, uh, a big deal about this. Are you able to shed a bit more light on that? And is, is that really what Nate got paid? Well, uh, here's the thing. So, fighter pay in the UFC has always been uh, a private issue, and I don't, I don't really feel like it's anybody's business. Um, he has made he has made statements about his pay in general, um, whatever that number may be, um, that he was unhappy about it and he wanted to be able to sit down with uh, the UFC and talk about it. Um, but I really don't feel comfortable discussing other people's money um, and their paychecks. I mean, it's yeah, no, absolutely not really anybody's business, so to speak. Yeah, no, absolutely, Mike. We totally understand that. Um, now, obviously, Nate was taken down from the rankings uh, this week. Um, it's Dana White said it's because he's been waiting for Nate to make up his mind whether he wants to fight in the UFC or not. Um, have, have you had a chat with Nate about that? And is that something that uh, that Nate cares about being taken down from the <clears throat> from these UFC well, rankings? I mean, here, yeah, here's the thing. So, I understand the whole point of inactivity. But then there has to be some kind of consistency. Whether a fighter doesn't agree to a bout or a fighter is injured, either way, they're inactive. So if you're going to keep TJ Grant on there for a year and Dominic Cruz on there for two years and even Gray Maynard, whom Nate beat at the same time as they fought each other, then why do you take this guy down? You know what I mean? I mean, it just it doesn't make any sense. It makes sense to to take off the inactive fighters to give way for the active fighters. But then there has to be some kind of a rule that's been established and agreed upon and what have you by everybody. My understanding is these ratings are a collaboration between various media outlets and various different voting outlets that comprise together a panel that votes for it, right? So if there was a rule in place, then somebody should have let us all know about it, right? We didn't know about it until just out of the blue, people just start popping off of there. And it goes for inactivity. So to me, that just undermines the entire concept of this ranking. So really, I don't care. Uh, you know, so whatever. You want to take him off? Take him off. It's fine. It's your rankings anyway. Yeah, that's right. And there I mean, is. If you look at if you look at uh, USA Today rankings, he's still ranked number nine. So they didn't take him off. 
You know what I mean? And somebody else's rankings is still ranked. And the UFC ranking is not ranked, so it's whatever. Who cares? Yeah, you know, there is some criticism of the UFC rankings, especially with the idea that they did only bring them in once they uh, joined up with Fox, Fox, and that's just being the only reason. But um, I was going to say, uh, I was going to say, Mike, obviously, um, it, it, it's a bit of a frustrating situation, a little bit of a frustrating situation. Do things like that hurt negotiations when you guys are, are trying to, you know, figure out the best suit for your client and for uh, working with the UFC potentially? Does that sort of hurt talks and negotiations a little bit? that he was taken off the rankings? Yeah, the things like that. Well, if you look at the rankings and him, him being number five at the time when he was taken off, and you take it for the merits of his performances and the caliber of competition that he's beaten to get ranked, then being taken off or being put on doesn't change the fact that he's beaten half the people on that roster. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's just a matter of how you look at it, right? I mean, he beat Donald Cerrone, he beat Jim Miller, he beat Gray Maynard. So they're all ranked. So you take me off, that's fine, but I still beat him. I mean, that, that's, and that, that doesn't go away. You know what I mean? And so, you know, it's just a matter of how you look at it, I guess. Most people consider Nate in top five best fighters in the world. I mean, best, best 155 pounders in the world regardless of whether he's recognized that way officially or not. So, you know, it's whatever. And I think that's why, you know, the big uproar came about, about Nate being, you know, taken off the rankings, mainly from the fans' perspective, because everybody does want to see Nate back in the octagon. Um, Nate, obviously, is, you know, is, is on the sidelines at the moment. What, what exactly is the main reason, you know, why, why Nate, you know, doesn't have a fight lined up at the moment? Well, we, we asked to sit down and have a conversation about our contract, and... Um, they said no. So we said, okay, well, then we'll sit out and wait until, you know, something changes. So from, from a manager's perspective at the moment, at the moment you guys are basically waiting until, until you know, some either a better offer comes along or the UFC changes something. Is that correct? Well, for, I mean, right now, I don't know. We're just kind of all in limbo, you know. Hopefully we'll sit down and have a productive conversation. So far, all of our interaction has been through media. You know, we say something, and then they say something, and then we say something. But you have to actually have a conversation. Um, I had a brief conversation with uh, Joe Silva, and, you know, he said, well, it's not going to happen. So we said, okay, sounds good. Well, then we'll just wait. Wait and see. But we don't have a specific goal. Like, I don't, you know, we just want to be able to have a conversation and see what happens. Absolutely, Mike. You know, and that, that does seem a little bit silly and trivial that um, you guys – you know, I don't have an opportunity to sit down and have a conversation just yet. But I was going to say, Nate um, on Twitter asked for a release from his contract a while back. Um, would, if, if, you know, worst comes to worst and you guys can't come to a good deal with the UFC or you guys don't agree on certain things, would Nate be open to fighting in other organizations in the future? Or is obviously he's had such a great career in the UFC, is uh, continuing fighting in the UFC an important uh, aspect for Nate? No, I mean, Nate will be open to fighting anywhere where he's paid the most and where his stock has the most value. <clears throat> but we are under contract with the UFC, so it really doesn't matter. It's kind of a silly question. Unless we get a release, this, this scenario doesn't exist. So what's the difference? Well, let's talk about uh, obviously. Obviously, Nate is in the UFC now. Another one of your your you know friends or, or clients, King Mo. He's in Bellator. Um, he's what are the, what are the main differences between dealing with the UFC as opposed to dealing with Bellator, and what would you say the pros and the cons would be? I mean, not a whole lot. It's just you know, it's different people, so you have different dynamics. But at the end of the day, you know, there are contracts in place, and then. They're promoters. They're trying to do what's best for them. We're trying to do what's best for us. We we'll try to find a common ground somewhere. Uh, speaking of uh, Mo's contract, obviously he had a very um, interesting one where it was partly a wrestling one with the uh, total nonstop action TNA wrestling and uh, one, a fighting one with Bellator. Um, we haven't seen Mo do much wrestling as of late. Um, is that something he's still interested in doing, or does he still want to? Does he just? <laughs> yeah, he is. He is. I mean, we had some setbacks. You know, he had two losses to uh, Manuel Newton, which kind of derailed uh, the whole idea of getting um, uh, getting the Bellator light heavyweight belt. And um, you know, before you go dabbling into 
something like pro wrestling, you should probably conquer your own art first. Mm. And you know, we've, we've had we've had little little setbacks on it. So now we're, you know, we're 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 going through the the fights that we need to go through to get to the title shot again, and and hopefully capture it this time, and then revisit the whole idea again. Uh, but it wasn't due to a lack of interest. It's just you know, it's just not how how the chips fell, so to speak. Now, King Mo, obviously, he's got a big fight coming up against Rampage Jackson on, on Bellator's 120 pay-per-view. Uh, you know, it's it's big deal, big fight. Um, and he, throughout his career, you know, he's been quite the performer. Do you do you think that, you know, King Mo has what it takes to become, you know, the next big star in MMA? Well, King Mo is already a star in MMA. I mean, that's what fighting on TV allows you to do is you're, you're, you're able to track ratings and fan reactions to when you fight versus somebody else fights. And you're able to identify people that, as the TV people say, move the needle, and the people that don't move the needle. And Mo has always moved the needle. Mm-hmm. I mean, Mo has been in a very unique position where he kind of came into stardom very early on in his career. I mean, with just five fights in Japan, he was already, you know, a, a there was already a buzz going around about him. And then he fought, you know, in just his sixth fight, in just his sixth fight ever in MMA, he fought Kegar Musashi to a five-round decision to win the strike force light heavyweight title and at the time Masashi was on an eighteen fight win streak. You know what I mean? So Mo's been Mo's always been in a spotlight. I mean he's he's got uh he's got the if factor, he's got the charisma, he's got the personality. Controversial whether you like him or you don't like him, at least he he makes you react, whether it's in a positive way or a negative way. It really doesn't make a difference. Because the key to the key to um, success is to have the ability to get people to react to you, whether they like you or they don't like you, at least it causes a reaction. The worst thing you can do is just you know, have people be indifferent. And there's some great advice there from Mike Hogan. Uh, I guess hopefully people aren't too indifferent to this show. I was going to say, uh, Mike, obviously the big uh, Bellator pay-per-view, um, people have criticized the decision for Bellator going down the road of having a pay-per-view rather than having the free card and getting a lot more eyes on the product. Obviously, as a businessman, someone with great insight into the business, what are your thoughts about this pay-per-view? Do you think they'll do well, or do you think they should have stuck to the free-to-air TV they were doing before? Well, here's the thing. I'm not in a position to make those decisions, so it really doesn't matter. Um, You know, I don't have all the data that they have to make the decision whether it should be a pay-per-view or not. I know that there have been cards that had far less interesting fights than the ones that are that are on a Bellator card that the promoter felt that that they were justified in charging people to pay for it. So, you know, why not? I mean, this is a fight that that has been brewing for the last four years. You know, you have two very talented athletes um, that genuinely hate each other and are kind of put in a position of a must-win situation. I mean, this fight. You know, this fight is not for the belts or for the glory. This fight is for bragging rights. This fight is for who gets to tell who I beat ERS on May 17th. You know what I mean? And that's it's rare that this actually happens. You know what I mean? A lot of times people, people talk crap about each other. But really, they're just trying to hype a fight. These two guys really don't like each other. They're both uh, very talented. They're both very dominant. And they both have said so much about each other that it's almost like how do you wake up the next morning if you've just lost this fight and face the world you know what I mean like what do you tell them how do you bounce from it so you know this this is probably the most important fight in most career and he's trained like he's never trained before he looks sharper than he's ever has he's, he's, he's working his ass off because this fight is for the you know this fight is for nothing but nothing else I mean but yeah it'll lead into a title fight because it's tournament final and the winner will face for the title and the title. This fight is for the bragging rights. This fight is for the right to be at a post-fight press conference and sitting on the winner's side and be like, I beat that dude's ass and now he needs to shut up and never talk about me again because I beat him. You know what I mean? That's the beauty of of this sport is it's like no other. You look at football, you look at, uh, well, I guess you call it, you guys, we call it, you know, we call it football, American football, or you look at basketball or you look at whatever even tennis, where it's just two people in there, when you say I beat his ass, it's all metaphorically speaking, right? Well, 
in MMA, you literally beat the other guy's ass. <laughs> I mean, you were punching him in the face. You know what I mean? So you get to you get to you get to go to the post fight press conference and have the bragging rights of saying, "You talk trash, I talk trash, I beat your ass." Now shut up. <laughs> and that's way more important than than all the titles in the world. Well, I think if we weren't excited enough as it was, I think we're a lot more excited now as well. Um, and I, yeah, we, we all we all can't wait for that fight. Now, I wanted to ask you something. Yeah, also. I mean, you know, people that tune in to watch it, I mean, they basically get to witness two guys that have talked trash about each other, and 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 only one of them will walk away with 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 the right to keep doing it, and the other one will just have to be quiet. Wow. Well, at the end of the day, you know, some martial arts purists, sometimes they say they watch for technique and things like that, but I think it's human nature, you know, if if, if you watch two guys fighting, if you don't know who they are, you don't care about them, you're not really going to care, but, you know, if you have some kind of emotional attachment, whether you're a Rampage guy or a King Mo, I think that's always going to, you know, spice things up for you and make you want to tune in. I think this is definitely one of those Yeah, fights. I mean, this is, you know, their, their feud is, is a very true-to-life situation, right? I mean, people beef with other people all the time, mm. except... When you, you know, when you're not a professional athlete, a professional fighter, you don't get to punch the other guy in the face, or at least you don't get to do it without going to jail. Mm. And here, you know, you just get to sit down and watch two guys that really hate each other duke it out, and one of them be able to say, "Yeah, I beat your ass, so now shut up." You know what I mean? And as humans, we just get satisfaction in it because we've all been in those situations. You know what I mean? So even though it's not us fighting against the people that we have had beef with, we're just able to resonate with it and just be like, "Yeah." That was cool. See, you talked all that crap, and now you got his ass beat. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, yeah, it, it, we already know exactly where we're going to be on the 17th of May, checking out Bellator 120. Yeah, and the beauty here is, like, you know, sometimes you have, you have like, the bad guy and the good guy. You know what I mean? Like, when GSP fights, he's always the good guy, and then no matter who he fights, they're always, like, you know, on the other side or whatever, right? Or sometimes like, you have the, the good guy and the bad guy, and then you have fans that are rallying behind the, the good guy to beat the bad guy. Well, here you got, like, two guys are just talking trash, so mm. the fans are split right down the middle. You know, if you're a Rampage fan, you're cheering for him. If you're a Mo fan, you're cheering for him. And that's, there's that. Now, I wanted to ask you, Mike, uh, from a management, from a manager's position, obviously you see a lot of, you know, what goes in behind the scenes, contract, things like that. I don't want to know about anyone's pay or anything like that, but how do you see MMA in the next five years in regards to fighter pay? Obviously, you know, you got Floyd Mayweather, who's apparently getting $70 million. The MMA, still a very new sport. They haven't quite, you know, they haven't quite caught up to boxing numbers or anything like that. Do you think the pay will increase significantly in the next five years? Well, it really depends. Uh, I think MMA needs to make a decision whether it's a sport uh, in a sense of a, a, an organized, you know, uh, sporting league like soccer or or basketball or whatever, or whether it's price fighting, which is what boxing is, right? And if it's a price fighting, then there needs to be some legislature uh, in place like there is in boxing. In the U.S., we have the Muhammad Ali Act, which gives fighters, especially the fighters at the top, leverage to negotiate, uh, leverage to know exactly what the, the profits are that the promoter makes and can be able to leverage that against what they feel that they should get. And it also gives them the ability to be associated with various different promoters and only do one fight at a time or two fights at a time or whatever and imbalance and go to the highest bidder. Um, MMA doesn't let you do that. But at the same time, MMA doesn't have the powers that other leagues have, like collective bargaining with the unions or, you know, an ability to to set some minimal standards that, that that have to be followed. There are some standards that, for example, the UFC enforces. You know, they have a base pay that starts at a certain level. But that's just the numbers they came up with. You know, there was no input from the fighter side. So, you know, I think it's going to be interesting to see how the landscape changes. Uh, if, if MMA continues to grow on, on public television, then inevitably they will eventually have to start forming more of a league kind of format and, and you know, have fair compensations and give people the ability to, you know, really make a career out of it. I mean, I don't think an average person realizes the hardships that a no-name fighter that's making, you know, 10 and 10 to fight goes to. Uh they literally do it mostly for the passion of the, of the fighting. You know what I mean? And it sounds nice and dandy, but when you've done 10 years of fighting and you're getting punched in the face and 10 years goes by and you don't have nothing to show for it, it's kind of sad. You know? Even in the NFL, 
and you can play for 10 years, nobody ever heard of you. But when you retire, at least you have a pension, you, know, you have health insurance, you have, you have things that you can at least go on with. But here you have guys that have no other skill except for punching people in the face with nothing to do, and they've earned virtually no money to speak of, and in majority. I mean, I know we always focus on the handful that have made money, and people say, well, you know, you could be like him and make as much money. That's true. But not if everybody was like GSP, then we wouldn't know what it's like to be GSP, right? Because then we have not, no frame of reference. Everybody's a star. Everybody's making gazillions. <clears throat> but what about the, the, uh, the other guys? If you compare it to other sports, no matter what happens, now if you mismanage your money and you're, you're an idiot, then that's, that's on you. But at least you're given the opportunity. You know, you retire from the NFL, you play there for 10 years and nobody knew about you, you were just another guy on the roster, you know, you might, you will have your whatever pensions they have, 100000 or 120000 which is not going to, you know, make you super rich, but it allows you to pay your bills and, 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 and live. You know what I mean? And if you are smart with your money and you save some of it and invest it or whatever, maybe you'll have a life. But it's like, <clears throat> imagine going to college and having a job lifespan of 10 to 15 years at the most. And when you're done, you have nothing to show for it. I mean, that's pretty sad. Mm -hmm. I don't think a lot of people realize it. So most of these guys are forced into having other careers. Seems they can't fully concentrate on what they're doing because they have to have a job just to pay the bills. And when they're done, you know, a lot of them just sit there and kind of be like, well, what the hell am I going to do now? I don't know. It's a scary thought. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, and only fighters are put in that position. Promoters are not put in that position. They just keep getting new fighters. Managers are not put in that position. We just keep getting new fighters. But the fighter himself has got nowhere to go and nothing to do and nothing to show for it. That's pretty sad. Absolutely, Mike. That's a really, really good point. And what I wanted to um, also say is, you know, obviously with MMA growing now, you have a lot of kids going into the sport as well. They're age 17, 18, 19. And uh, that, like you said, that's all they know. Whereas previously, you know, you had people with other professions going into the sport. Um, do you think there should also be some sort of uh, system where, like you said, they learn other skills while they're, while they're um, MMA fighters? For example, if you're a kid who's 17, 18, 19, and you're in a major organization like Bellator or the UFC, should there be some kind of program where you learn an alternative skill so when you get out, um, you can go on to do something else? Well, maybe. I mean, you know, all of it has to do with economics. I mean, uh, to compare the UFC to the NFL is not really fair to the UFC either because the NFL receives $9 billion in TV deals. Mm. You know I mean, plus sponsorships, plus merchandise sales, plus ticket revenues. And we're not talking about 10,000 people. We're talking about 60, 70,000 people sitting in the stadium, uh, you know, plus other subsidies. So, yeah, they have a lot more money to work with, and they have a lot more uh, opportunities to create, you know, different... Um, different platforms for for the players and and, and uh, uh, you know what happens to them, especially in, in post post NFL careers. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's very difficult to do that with the current finances in the UFC. But yet, you know, as the sport grows more and the revenues start getting bigger, you know, that's going to be a concern. That's going to be something that needs to be addressed. You know what I mean? So I don't want to sound like it's just, you know, like I'm saying they're the big bad wolf and and everybody else is just suffering. But, you know, a lot of it has to do with economics. I mean, right now there's a there's a big debate going on about drug testing and whether the league should be paying for the drug testing. And it costs $20,000 at the cheapest to test a fighter. Well, it's just economically unfeasible. So, you know, you got to find a solution to it. So, you know, it's still a young sport. I mean, we're looking at sports like the NFL. NFL has been around forever, for, for a long time. So has boxing. So has baseball. So has basketball. So they've had a chance to work out all the kinks. I think MMA is still growing, so it's still working stuff out. Hmm. And speaking of growing, obviously, with a lot of those sports, they do have uniforms, and the UFC has expressed interest in bringing in their own uniforms. Um, but a lot of the fighters have been in a bit of an uproar because they're worried about their sponsors, and, you know, the UFC might be a little bit more, um, I guess, tight as far as who, who's allowed in, how many sponsors you can have on those uniforms and things things like that. What do you think about, you know, bringing in these uniforms? Well, here's the thing. So, first of all, sponsorships in the UFC are a luxury. If you read the UFC contract or any promoter's contract, sponsorships are 
within the discretion of the of the organization. And that's been letting people have sponsors, so it's almost became a given, but it's not a given, it's in the contract that states that they can yank any logos they want and they can put any logos they want. So in essence, the whole uniform argument shouldn't even be an argument because contractually they've already agreed to it. They just didn't know they did. Um, but it, once again, it it matters how it's approached and how it's done. Every sport has a uniform. I mean, the basketball players aren't run around in different uniforms or whatever they feel like putting on. Everybody has a uniforms. So I wouldn't imagine that UFC would introduce something without compensating the fighters. Now, whether the compensation is fair or not, you know, it's in the eye of the beholder. I mean, some people might be fair and some people won't. I think it'll hit hardest the people that are on the top echelon of the UFC and are getting big bucks from their sponsors. But then again, there are such things as endorsement deals. You know what I mean? Um, so, for example, uh, Michael Jordan well, used to endorse Wheaties and Hanes. Well, he didn't run around in Hanes underwear on the court, did he? <laughs> you know what I mean? So... That's a whole different story. Nobody's stopping you from doing that. So it'll change the landscape. But I think for a lot of the smaller guys that are fighting on the undercard and are getting a thousand, fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars at the most, they might actually benefit from it. They might be getting more money. So we just we don't know. I just and it is one of those like it's a very like bitch first, ask questions later kind of a <laughs> landscape. Like all we do is just bitch and then and then we figure out what's going on and we're like, Oh that's what just let it play out and see what happens. And then you can bitch about it, especially when you really don't have much ground to bitch on because, like I said, you already agreed to this in the contract. You just don't know you did. Well, you should know you did. You know what I mean? So I'm one of those people that says, well, let's see what, you know, what's the, what's the deal? I mean, what are they offering? What are they saying? You know what I mean? What kind of transitional time are you getting? You know what I mean? Like, let's say they say, okay, by next year, you know, or we're going to let your existing contracts run out and then we'll switch over. Or we'll buy out your contracts and run out and then let's switch over. You know what I mean? Because, yeah, there are those factors like, you know, John Jones signed a deal with Nike. I don't know what his deal is like, but let's say it's contingent upon him wearing the uniform inside the cage and it was approved and done with. And now all of a sudden here comes the UFC and says, you got to take that stuff off and put Under Armour on. And he said, well, I'm going to lose, you know, a lot of money. Do they say, no problem, we'll compensate you for the money you lose it. To be fair, or do they say we're gonna we're gonna let your contract expire, just don't resign it, and then we'll work out a deal? Or are they gonna say well, we don't really give a shit, and your contract says we can change it, so we're changing to have a nice day? Okay, then you can go fish. <laughs> that's a, that's a great point there, Mike. And final question before we go on to the tap out round, which will be a lot of fun. Um, obviously, you've mentioned uh, a lot of really interesting points here. Um, one of the things I was going to ask you about was. Obviously, after an event, for example, a UFC event, they disclose uh, money as in terms of show money and stuff like that, but they don't disclose 100% of the money that the fighters make. Do you think, like in boxing, um, people sh that they should disclose publicly how much every fighter makes because um, then it will make a good, um, a good case for managers and people trying to negotiate contracts knowing exactly who makes what and where they stand in the sport? Well, I think that's a that's a question that needs to be put up for debate and, and an input from a lot of the different fighters should come in. Um, I mean, um, you know, I don't know how it's in Australia, but in the U.S. it's usually not very polite to ask people what they make. So some people like to keep their earnings private for whatever reasons. Um, you know what I mean? Um, but at the same time, if there is a if there is a rule like there is in boxing. With uh, you know, there's actual legislation that that says that there has to be transparency. You have to know what the fighters make, and the fighters have to know what the promoter makes. And everybody has to know what everybody makes, and then they can make a deal. If such a law exists, then everything gets disclosed, not just what the fighters make. <laughs> Otherwise, it's up to a, you know, I think it's left up to an individual fighter. And so far, I haven't seen anybody complain that their earnings aren't being reported or or they are being reported. So. Yeah, well, there you go. I think it's just public. I mean, I think it's just public curiosity um, as to what what other people make. You know what I mean? Mm. But MMA doesn't have these crazy numbers like they do in boxing, so it wouldn't be as exciting. You know what I mean? It's far more exciting to hear that Shaquille O'Neal signed a 
five year of you know $120 million contract because it just makes us go, wow, that's a lot of money. Uh, these numbers don't exist in the UFC. So what, I mean, in the MMA period, so what's the point? I, yeah, that is a good point. Um, now, Mike, what we're going to do now is uh, something that we call this. You know what I mean? It's like when, 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 the, when the commission discloses the numbers and most people log in to read, they only read what the headliners mean. They don't give a shit what some guy on the undercard mean. Right, they go, oh, this guy made 88. Oh, okay, great. They go, whatever. So what's the point? Hmm. Now, Mike, what we're going to do is something that we like to call the Submission Radio Tap Out Round. Uh, this is basically the getting to know you round. We're going to ask you a bunch of questions. It's kind of like a word association, and you pretty much answer them quickly. Uh, are you ready? Mm-hmm. So now, Mike, what's the best thing about being a manager? The best thing about being a manager is being associated with guys and being able to be part of their lives and being able to hopefully positively change their lives for the best. Very rewarding, especially when... You, you do something because you have a gut feeling and it, and it pans out and things just fall into place. This it, it, is a phenomenal feeling. Okay, if you could manage one person in the music industry, who would it be? In the music industry? Uh, I don't know, Beyonce knows. If you were stuck on an island, you can only bring three people with you. Who do you bring? Uh, I bring my wife and my daughter. Okay. Uh, finish this sentence. I don't need anybody else. Finish this <laughs> sentence. On the weekends, I... On the weekends, I try to spend as much time with my family as I can. Do you think that Bellator World Series of Fighting could be a real competitor to the UFC one day? Or do you already think that Bellator is? Um, I think it could be, yes. Okay. Who's the b- biggest practical joker of all your clients? Um, practical joker. Always used to be, and then he kind of grew out of it. <laughs> now, Mike, what was the last movie Mike Hogan saw in the cinemas? I'm sorry, what was the what? What was the last movie that you saw in the cinemas? Last movie that I saw in the cinemas. I don't really go to the cinemas that much, because eventually it all comes out on DVD. The last movie I just saw was The Butler. Nah, that's a good one. Oh, yeah. uh, what is your next goal as a powerful manager in MMA? Uh, my next goal, <clears throat> I would love to diversify my guys' exposure and be able to dial it into <clears throat> unrelated to fighting uh, industries. Great answer, Mike. All right, guys. So that is Mike Kogan. You can check him out on Twitter and also make sure that you uh, you check out the Big King Mo, uh, Rampage Jackson fight happening on Bellator 120. Mike, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for stopping by on Submission Radio. Thank you. Thank you. So there you have it, guys. The one and only Mike Kogan talking about his client, Nate Diaz, and some of his other friends. Yeah, that's right. You know, it's uh, it's good that Mike came on the show and obviously he had some different opinions to a lot of other people. And that's why Submission Radio is around. You know, we love having managers, fighters come on and talk about how they feel. You know, we're a show. It's very, very open to people sharing their opinion. And um, we appreciate Mike's time for coming on and clarifying the situation. But our next guest, John Hackleman, you know, he had a, a pretty tough weekend over UFC 172. Yeah, he did. Obviously, you know, he's he's big fighter, Glove to share. Uh, you know, he he didn't quite get that title. He came up a little bit short against John Jones. Still fought valiantly. Still showed a lot of heart. And uh, we want to get a breakdown uh, from him on what exactly went wrong in that fight. You know, obviously, obviously uh, Glover would have come in with with a good game plan and very confident. So I think it's time to get John on the show. Uh, I think it's time for our next guest. Our next guest on Submission Radio is a world-renowned coach. He is coach to guys like Glover Teixeira, Chuck Liddell, Steven Saylor, and a whole lot more. He's one of the most interesting personalities in MMA. John Hackleman, welcome back to Submission Radio. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, you know, uh, John, you know, it's a pleasure having you on. Getting right into it, right off the bat, um, you know, it's been a couple of weeks since UFC 172 where Glover tri- uh, fought John Jones for the light heavyweight title. Um, things didn't really quite go as planned. Uh, how's Gl- Glover doing and how are the injuries going from the fight? Uh, he's good. He's waiting uh, to decide on a, a doctor. Um, he's got to have surgery. So um, he kind of threw the whole plan off in the first round when he got. Uh, you know, he got the shoulder crank and he tore, he actually tore his labrum, labrum in the first round. 
Um, so that kind of threw everything off. He couldn't execute the punches, the combinations, the takedowns. I mean, I mean, the right arm wasn't uh, really working. Um, so, yeah, it did, it did throw things off a bit. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, John. Yeah, that that arm crank that, that John Jones put on Glover it really it really did seem to affect the fight. Um, what what exactly was the game plan coming into that fight for Glover? Well, it would have been getting inside, uh, make up the distance, close the distance, uh, and bang away and get takedowns. And you know he couldn't even grab at all um, for the takedown. He tried a couple, but he had no strength in his right arm, so. That kind of took care of that, and then, you know, the punching with his right arm—he couldn't throw it like he like he does. You know, it had nothing on it. Like I said, he he tore his labrum in the very first round, so um, it was kind of you know it was an uphill battle, and and he tried the best. He he put a really tough effort, effort in and uh, uh, did the best he could. You know. And, you know, Glover really showed his heart in that fight because, I, get, I mean, everybody watching at home, no one really realized that he tore his labrum. So, I um, mean, it was a great effort yeah, from him. Yeah. But, yeah, um, I didn't even know. Oh, really? He didn't He didn't let you know throughout the fight that he, nah, he thinks he, he did nah, shoulder? He told, me, nah, he told me after, well, you could see after, as soon as the fight was over, you know, I just looked at his shoulder, and then the dress room, it just swelled right up to the side. It looked like he had a shoulder on, in front of his shoulder. Oh, um, yeah. and um started uh and i asked him why did you tell me i could have tried to change up the game plan or i could have you know tried to work around it he's like because he was scared if he told me i would stop the fight so. wow mm. now obviously obviously that was a big game changer the, the torn labrum um other than that was there anything anything about the fight or about john jones in the fight that surprised you well, it did then uh, the way the the way he was willing to you know get inside and get in the pocket with Glover, but I mean it, you know I mean I didn't I didn't know it at the time why Glover wasn't you know taking full advantage of it. Now I do, and so I mean that that kind of surprised us that there was so much inside work by John, which I mean I was taking anything away from him. I mean number one he caused the damage on Glover, so that's you know wasn't you know, an accident, you know, was, and then, um, you know, and then the fact that, you know, he, he was able to, you know, utilize his game plan a lot better after the fact. Now, uh, John, things like the shoulder crank, what are your thoughts on moves like that? Obviously, John Jones has a lot of interesting moves like that. He's got the kick to the knee, um, the sh that shoulder crank that he did in Glover. Do you think um, do you think those moves uh, should be allowed in MMA, or what are your thoughts on those kinds of moves? Do you think it's fair because if you do hurt the opponent, you hurt him, it's a fight, or do you think those kinds of moves maybe shouldn't be allowed because you know they are quite dangerous to the fighters? No, I mean I think it's picking and choosing what's what's legal and what's not a little sometimes randomly and sometimes without any real rhyme or reason. Um, you know. I, I think they are. I mean, they, they're legal. I mean, they sh they should be. But then other, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna legalize, you know, linear kicks that could hurt the knee, you know, then I mean, why can't you do, you know, small joint manipulation? Why can't you do? Uh, you can't even grab the fence, but you can, you know, crank someone's shoulder, which is legal and it's fine. Then why can't you, you know, I don't know, why can't you do a 12 to 6 elbow? I mean, so it's like. I'm sure they're doing the best they can. They do a great job, but um, there are some inconsistencies. But, but like I said, there's going to be because it's the nature of the beast, and it's it's still the best show in town and the best rules. But some kind of don't make as much sense as others, you know. I think yeah, I think the rules in a lot of ways are still playing catch up. Um, and I think yeah, I think yeah, it's, it's a new, relatively new sport, and I think they're doing a great job. I think the rules are you know, make for a really exciting fight, but I think some things, you know, you can do certain things, like you can, you know, crank someone's shoulder and rip it, but you can't do a small joint manipulation because you might break their pinky. Mm -hmm. But breaking the shoulder, ripping the shoulder is okay, and then you can hit him in the head as hard as you want and cause a subdural hematoma, you know, but you can't heel kick to the kidneys. I mean, there's some, like I said, some things make absolutely no sense. And, but still, it's the best game in town. Yeah. You know? Well, that, that, that's why we all love it. 
And, uh, you know, Glover, he didn't, he didn't quite get that belt, but he's still an amazing fighter. What do you think are some of the positives coming out of this fight? Well, I mean, I think the main positive, because people already know how hard he hits. They've seen it. Um, they've seen his one-punch knockout power. They've seen his unbelievable power in submissions and skill in submissions. They've seen his really good wrestling. I mean, took down Rampage, you know, six or seven times. I mean, so they've seen all, if they've seen his conditioning, they've seen him go, now they've seen him, you know, go five, but they've seen him go three rounds really strong. So they know his conditioning. But now the X factor has been exposed. Um, and that, you know, he's passed with flying colors. I mean, does he have a chin? Obviously, he has a great chin. And does he have the heart? I, I most certainly does. I mean, this, this answer that question because he, he answered him with flying colors. So I think it's, it's, it's raised his stock because not only does he have all the things that they knew, but now that X factor isn't, isn't a surprise anymore or a question mark. It's a, it's a, def, it's a, exclamation point now john one of the other things i wanted to ask you about was the jones uh, hands in the face that he had throughout the fight um in front of glover's face obviously there were a few eye pokes that came from that um glover did say that he wasn't that happy about the the hand being in the face for that much of the fight do you think people should be allowed to keep their hands right in front of someone's face obviously due to the um health implications that it could have for the eyes I mean, I, yeah, I think you should be able to if you can do it, you know, without poking the eyes. I think, I think if you're going to do it, uh, it should be really closely monitored. And, you know, if you go in, you know, go near the, the eyes or, you know, hurt the, you know, go in the eye, you get a warning and then boom. I think it should go right to points away or, you know, or, you know, more, more, um, um, you know, punishments. I and mean, if you're going to do it and you do it right, like, I think John does it. I wasn't the one being touched in the face. Glover was, so I, I can't answer it uh, with the clarity that Glover can, so he could answer better than I could. But say it was me, you know, it, it, would, it would irritate me, but then as soon as the fingers start going in my eye, I think, like I said, there should be one warning, and then it should be points taken away or even more if there's going to be any fingers in the eyes, or else, you know, let, let the, you know, the groin shots and, and, you know, hitting in the back of the skull legal, too. But... Like I said, I don't, I'm not, with that said, I'm not saying that John Jones, uh, was, uh, fouling at all. And that would be only, the only person that can answer that question is Glover. So, but my, my, my answer to my question is, if you can put your face, your hand in somebody's face without sticking your fingers in the eye, then I think it should be perfectly legal. So that's, that's my answer to that. So, yeah, well, obviously. Makes sense. Now, obviously, Glover's you know going to continue fighting in the light heavyweight division, and I'm assuming he'd like that you know rematch against John Jones. After a loss, a lot of people th often throw around the term "back to the drawing board." Now, as far as lessons uh, go, moving on from this fight, do you think there's something that uh, specifically that you need to or want to work on with Glover for the next next time or next rematch, or do you think it more just comes down to different game plan? I, I think the game plan was really good. I would stick with the same game plan. I mean, like you said, that shoulder crank was unexpected by everyone. I'm sure it was just all of a sudden, I'm sure John Jones didn't even train for it. It just happened. And he presented himself and he took advantage. But so I don't see any really huge game plan changes. Um, I think if Glover's arm wasn't hurt in the first round, it would have been a different fight. But more power to John, John Jones because he, he was able to take advantage of a shoulder crank early on and, and I think change the outcome of the fight. And that's you know, that's not taking nothing away from him. It's only adding to his skill and uh, ingenuity as a fighter. Now, speaking of uh, things that John worked on, we actually had Mike Wickle, John, on the show last week, and he told us that a lot of Jones, Jones's unorthodox techniques are based on Kempo. Um, now that you've seen some of the effectiveness of the techniques that Jones uses, obviously you have a huge uh, Kempo background yourself. Um, do you think you'll be employing some of the similar, some of those similar effective techniques with your fighters in the future? Uh, no, I, I have my, 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 I mean, I mean, our stuff works pretty good. I mean, I, you know, I, I think Jackson's guys and Winkle John's guys are good, but I, I think we have a much smaller camp, but I think my win percentage is, is just as good or better. Um, I think what we're doing is working and, uh, and I'll stick with our strategy. We do employ a lot of uh, 
you know, some of the traditional martial arts that I came up with, and and I'm sure most systems do. But I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't really like that front kick. A couple of my guys do it to the knee. You know, I just, I just don't really like it. I think it's, I don't think it's cheating, but I think it's kind of pushing that envelope. Just like, uh, yeah, I just don't like it. Um, but if it works for them, that's great, and and more power to them. And and my overhand right and my left hooks and. A lot of our strategies seem to work, be working pretty good too. Yeah. So, so just to clarify, you don't like that kick, kick to me because obviously it, it's quite a dangerous move to do to fighters. Obviously, rampage. Um, you know, had to have knee surgery after that kick, so you think it's just a high risk move to do, right? Is that yeah, right, John? Yeah, I mean, it is. But then again, I mean, I mean, it's not as high risk as you know hitting someone in the head really hard and giving him a freaking stroke. So. You know, I'd rather have to have knee surgery than a freaking, you know, I'm, than have my, you know, head head cut open and have brain surgery. So, I mean, it, it's dangerous, but that's a dangerous sport. And somebody cranks your shoulder, you got a shoulder surgery. Somebody cranks your knee, you got a knee surgery. But, you know, I, you know, it's dangerous, but it's a, it comes with a sport. I don't, I don't think it should be disallowed because it might hurt someone's knee. Just like I don't think punching to the head should be disallowed because it might cause brain damage. Mm. Now, obviously, the John Jones fight is still very fresh for for Glover. But looking to the future, and you know, to to rebuild a fantastic fighter in Glover, who would you like to see Glover fight next? Oh, anyone. It doesn't matter. I, I, I mean, like I said, I think I think Glover can beat anyone out there, and even more now that he's he's been there. He went five rounds with a ripped shoulder muscle, so I think I I think his next fight is just gonna he's just gonna get scarier and scarier now. And in terms of Glover, would uh, moving down a middleweight ever be an option, or do you think that's a, just the weight class that Glover couldn't make, or there's probably just no need to? Yeah, no, no Glover, Glover's never given up power for anyone, or he's never been the, the weaker or the smaller of the guys, you know. So I think, you know, walking around at 225, 230, it'd be pretty hard to make 185. So um, speaking of John Jones, uh, there's been some stuff in the media about Chuck Liddell saying some stuff about Jones. Do you think this is something that media is blowing out of proportion. Obviously, they're going for an angle where, um, you know, it seems like Chuck doesn't like John Jones. Can you uh, elaborate on that for us? I think it's an angle. I mean, to be honest, you know, I don't think John Jones or Chuck had as much to do with it as, as uh, the media. I don't know. It seemed like uh, they seem to be pushing that pretty hard. I think Jones' manager is kind of pushing it too, maybe to get some kind of, I don't know why, maybe get a big fight. I don't, I don't know why. To tell you the truth, you can go uh, LA. Um, but um, it's not between John and, and 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 Chuck. They have a lot of respect for each other. All kinds of. Um, so I think it's, I think it's uh, being propagated by maybe the Jones' manager or or the press or whatever. But I mean, all Chuck said was. In his prime, he thinks he could be, beat John Jones. And then when John Jones is retired, and Chuck's been there retired, so he's not saying now, he said in my prime. So when when John Jones is retired, you know, 10 years down the road or whatever, he'll probably be saying, yeah, I could probably, I could beat that guy. So, you know, if you ask Marvel and Angle if he could beat Bernard Hopkins, he'd probably say, you know, in his prime, he'd probably think he could beat him in his prime. I mean, if you don't, you know, you're, most fighters, believe they can beat anyone in their prime. So it was it was a it was kind of taken out of context like oh he wants to play a battle. No, what Chuck said was in his prime he thinks he had the tools to beat John Jones. He didn't say now, he said in his prime, which is not in his prime. So to take that out of context is stupid and I mean it's kind of a douchebag move if you ask me to try to make something of that and that's what people are doing they're trying to make something of it and they should just stop you know but anyway yeah I, that's how i feel about that thing i would agree um another one of your fighters i wanted to ask you about uh john last time we had you on your show you mentioned antonio banuelos uh he's getting set to yeah. return uh can you tell us a little bit more about how that's coming along i was getting in great shape um um, he's, uh, training really hard, changed his focus a lot. Um, 
working on his conditioning and his, his, his you know, just his overall game. His mind was kind of out of it for a little while. He wasn't performing up to par, um, even in his fights. But he, he's, I think he's turned it around and he's doing great. Uh, he's still, you know, on the weekends like to dress up like a girl and <laughs> and do that. But I mean, that doesn't really affect his training. So I just kind of don't even. It doesn't even bother me anymore. Now, I wanted to ask you, with Antonio, he he obviously used to be in the UFC for a short period of time. Um, wow. Is that is that something yeah. that he wants to make a, <clears throat> another run for and get back into that flight? Yeah, division? yeah, he does. He does. His, yeah, his, his goal is to, to get back into the UFC um, one step at a time. He's 125 now and, and makes it easily. Not easily, but he makes it. Uh, makes it. Um, and, he, and he's training hard and... and and sacrificing, making the proper sacrifice to get in uh, to the game. I mean, he doesn't, you know, party anymore on the weekends, uh, except for putting on a dress. Um, and so, uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's focused. Wow. Um, awesome. So, yeah, hopefully we'll see him soon. Now, John, we've got some fan questions here from some forums, uh, so we'll just shoot at you. Now, Flying Kimura wants to know, uh, why Glover almost never throws a left hand, a lead left hand and starts every combo with a cross counter. Um, we work a lot of left, left lead, left. Um, he just, I mean, everybody's different, and that's one thing that he's just really not comfortable with yet. Um, but like I said, he, it's, it's just something he likes. He likes to, you know, load up a little more than he should sometimes. Um, but he's working on, you know, the lead as a jab and a uh, counter left hook. Now, uh, speaking of speaking of tactics, flying wheel kick. Uh, wanted to ask you if if uh, if you noticed the Glover was continuing to circle on uh, John J- to Jones John Jones's inside when John Jones switched stances to southpaw. Um, flying flying wheel kick mentioned someone as slick as you. Did you think there's something that needed to be adjusted there? And uh, yeah, if, if you noticed at all during the fight, I don't, I think I, it wasn't. I wasn't getting the angles I needed. Um, completely but I, I think the strategy was perfect and I think I think you know just everything you know like Mike Tyson says you know everybody has a perfect strategy until they get punched in the face right mm. um, okay well I think every the strategy was perfect until he ripped his freaking shoulder you know so I right. think that's that kind of I mean mentally and physically you know I mean just tactically it threw everything off I mean I just like you know it just you have a game plan, and all of a sudden your shoulder's torn. Can you imagine? I mean, what goes through your mind? Then you got to go. Then your eyes cut open, so you go, you know, four more rounds like that. I mean, all the strategy kind of went out the window. And he was, he was in, you know, he was in survival mode, but he was actually trying to win. But it was just, you know, it was, so it threw everything off. Yeah. Now, John, it's time for the world famous tap out round, as rated in GQ magazine as the sexiest segment going around. Are you ready? Yeah, yeah, I'm ready. Okay, finish the sentence. People don't know that I... Ah, people don't know that I kiss random dogs when I see them on the street. <laughs> you know, I wasn't a big dog person, but I got a Sam White, and you know, I can I can totally sympathize with that. Um, I am, I am, honestly. Next question is, if you had a movie based on your life, who would play you, who would play Chuck, and who would play your girlfriend? Oh, yeah. Uh, my girlfriend would be played by um, 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 Jennifer Aniston. Yep. Mm. They, are, they have very similar sense of the humor. Um, <laughs> Chuck Liddell would be played by... Mickey Rourke. Nice. Mm. Nice. Yes, yes. And I would be played <laughs> by Mark Wahlberg. Wow. Mark Wahlberg. That, that, why, that's why, why Mark Wahlberg, John? Because I, I think he's the sexiest man alive. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, and for the record, I'd love to see Mickey Rourke with the mohawk and the tattoo on the side of his head. That would make my day. <laughs> Uh, Mo- moving on with the round, what's the strangest thing you've ever seen at an MMA event? What? What's the strangest thing that you've ever seen at an MMA event? 
strangest thing I've ever seen at an MMA event is... That's a weird one. That's an awkward one. Um, da, 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 da. Okay. Um, strangest thing I've ever seen at an MMA event. Uh, that's, that's almost a possible answer. <laughs> Have you ever seen yeah, anything strange behind the scenes strange. during the, in yeah, the crowd and okay. like that? I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Um, the guy warming up in the dress room by doing sprints down and back and forth in the hallway, slipping on some water and falling and getting knocking himself completely unconscious. Oh, wow. Yeah, that'll happen. Um, do you and Chuck Liddell ever have movie nights? And if you do, what is your favorite flick? Our favorite flick, and we can't get the name of it, is um, the movie, it's an old Kung Fu movie, and the, our favorite line is, the guy gets out of bed with some woman, and he says, get up, get dressed, make the bed, and get out. And we can't remember the name of it. But back back in the old days, uh, Chuck and I used to watch that movie all the time on VHS. Wow. What a champion um, of a man, too. Yeah, but okay, but our favorite movie that is actually out is uh, Shallow Howl. Mm, show the hell's awesome. Now, owning a mixed martial arts school, do you think that unqualified teachers are a problem in MMA and martial arts today? Uh, um, no. I, I, I actually think most gyms are run by really qualified guys. Some, sometimes, uh, sometimes, uh, yeah, sometimes overqualified, actually. Okay. Now, you're known as a striking coach, but how much grappling do you do? Uh, enough to get my guys where about half of my guys, uh, you know, win by grappling and uh, probably like 16% win by striking, 40% by grappling. My guys are pretty good. I know it. I know enough of it to, you know, avoid a takedown, get a takedown, you know, get a submission, avoid a sub submission, go for position, uh, sweep a position or escape, but I just don't like it. I like, I love, uh, the striking part. I love that part. I don't like grappling, but I know it enough to to be a you know a, a world. Well, I don't, I'm not being conceited. A world class coach. Of course. Now, um, what's the weirdest Halloween costume you've ever worn? I wore a priest uh, <laughs> uh, year before last. I was a priest, and uh, I my girlfriend was a Catholic. Uh, Cool girl, <laughs> and it was really awkward. It's gonna be on the left. <laughs> um, now, obviously, John, you've been training fighters for for quite a while. You've trained a lot of tough guys. Are you still invested in combat sports as you were ten years ago, or is MMA something that you think about less th these days? Uh, it's four twenty. Um, uh, it goes up and down. I mean, I, I still love martial arts as much as I did back in nineteen seventy when I first became infatuated with it. Um, and I love it just as much. Um, every bit as much, maybe even more. But, it, you know, sometimes I'm in, more into the MMA part. Sometimes I'm over the MMA part, and I, I just like the martial arts and fitness part. And So I go back and forth on that. But as a whole, whoa, um, I'm, I'm just as much as into martial arts as I have been since day one. And now, John, a quick one. When do, we, when do you think we'll see Steven Saylor back in the octagon? Uh, I say if, before the end of July. Okay, and uh, also, who's a fighter who you watch in the UFC that you would love to coach? Um, that I don't coach now. Um, yeah. My favorite fighter that I'm not coaching uh, would probably be... Um, um, uh, yeah. um, the Blau Aldo... That, that group. That's a wily group right uh, there. I think that would be amazing if you guys work together in the future. Guys, he is John Hackleman. Thank you so much for coming onto the show. You can catch him at pit underscore master and check out his schoolers at http forward slash the pit mma.com. John, this is the second time you've been on our show, so now you're a part of the Submission Radio family. I don't know if you realize that, but it's always a. I feel like, and I feel like it. Thank you very well, much. It's always a pleasure having you on, and we look forward to having you on in the future. And, yeah, all the best to Glover, and thank you so much for coming on. All right, well, thank you, and uh, 
I appreciate the call. Thank you very much. Bye. John Hackleman, guys, always a pleasure chatting to that guy. You know, he's so wise. He's been around the fight game for so long, managed fighters, um, and it's just always great to get his insights on the MMA game and just anything MMA. Yeah, that's right. So thanks for John for coming on. And, you know, now he's a part of the Submission Radio family, reoccurring appearances, and always a pleasure to speak to on the show. Our next guest, however, is also from a very uh, awesome team, Team Alpha Male. You know, we love having these guys on. And um, obviously, TJ Dillashaw is going to be having his big title shot against Hannon Brow at UFC 173. However, this man who's coming up next, Chad Mendes, will be having a title shot against Jose Aldo, trying to get that title. Uh, obviously, he had one shot before, but... Uh, didn't really wasn't really able to pull it out, so I'm um, very interested to see what this man has to say about it. And I think we have him on the backbone, Cass. All right, guys. Our next oh. guest owns wins over Cub Swanson, Eric Coke, Clay Guida, and recently over Nick Lentz. And he's looking to become the new featherweight champion against Jose Aldo at UFC 176 on August 2nd. He is none other than Chad Money Mendes. Chad, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Oh, thank you so much for coming on. Um, we'll just get right into it. We haven't seen you since your December win over Nick Lentz. Uh, did you have a feeling you were going to be next to fight Jose Aldo, and have you been training already for this fight? Yeah, I mean, that was definitely something that, uh, you know, we were hoping for right after that fight. Actually, it was something I was hoping for the last uh, two fights, but uh, it just didn't work out that way. And, um, you know, they were, the UFC was telling us that it's a good possibility that after the Lentz fight, that's who I was going to be fighting, so... Um, you know, just training, uh, obviously not training camp style training, but just, um, you know, maintaining, keeping up, learning some new stuff with Dwayne Ludwig. And, um, you know, I finally got the, the call not too long ago that that's, that's who it was going to be. And, uh, basically we were just waiting on the location and, uh, the date. We didn't know an exact date or location, but finally just got it. And, uh, UFC just posted about it. So now we're here talking about it. <laughs> Yeah, it's all official. So congratulations, Chad. Now, um, I was going to say, you just mentioned Ludwig. Obviously, he's sticking around for the TJ Dillashaw Championship match. Any chance he'll stick around a little bit longer uh, to help you prepare for this one? Yeah, he'll be here for the first first part of my camp. Uh, then he's moving to Denver. But, um, you know, we've talked, and there's still going to be some, some training going back and forth, whether he comes out back to Sacramento or we go to um, Colorado to do some training there. And, I mean, that'd be great for us because it's altitude anyway. So, um, yeah, we're definitely still going to be doing some stuff with Dwayne. Uh, in the meantime, we're still looking for that head coach. So um, we just had Martin Campman out, um, did some basically some trial practices, and he just kind of ran us through some stuff. And uh, we're just kind of testing it out and seeing if we like it. And um, I think we're going to try and bring in a couple other guys and just see see uh, what fits best for Team Austin Mel here in Sacramento. And hopefully we get that locked up soon. Ah, oh, awesome. Yeah, we uh, we actually did send in our uh, striking coach applications to Team Alpha Male. Uh, we haven't heard anything back, and now we hear, you know, Martin Campman's in the fold. Can't can't say that we're not hurt, Chad, but, you know, th that's okay. Um, <laughs> what what was it like uh, having Martin in there? How, how was he as a fit, and what, what did he bring to Team Alpha Male? Yeah, I, I like Martin. I've met Martin uh, a while back, a couple of fights. I think we've actually fought on a couple of cards, I'm pretty sure. At least he was there um, in the back, so... Um, he's a cool guy, actually, get along with him great. His style is, um, you know, he's a really good at a lot of the basic stuff, um, which I think is, is key for becoming, you know, a, a great athlete. You know, you, you see a lot of these wrestlers that are um, the top level that the reason why they're there is because they're so good at all the basics. So it's something I've always tried to focus on throughout my entire career as an athlete, and, uh, you know, I think that would be great for our team. So, like I said, we're just kind of trying it out and uh, see how the, the, the coaches kind of fit in. Uh, not only just technique-wise, but also personality and kind of just getting along with the team and kind of meshing well, you know, because it's basically, you know, family out here. And, you know, to have somebody that's kind of a more of an outcast that doesn't really fit in, it's, you know, it's not something we're really looking for. So we're just trying to find that one that one guy and hopefully we get him soon. That's right. And, you know, Martin Cameron, he's a great guy. He was on the show recently and he talked about how he doesn't like to watch uh, good shows because then he gets addicted and has to watch the whole season. So don't you show him any good shows over there in Sacramento? Now I was gonna, I was gonna ask Chad. Um, your last uh, loss to uh, obviously Jose Aldo. Um, it was a loss in the first round with, with the knee. Um, how much? How much did that loss bother you after the fight? How long? How long did you think about it? And um, tell us a little bit about um, how you kind of got over it and how you used it 
possibly as a motivator to get back in the title picture. Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of bothered me a little bit at first, but I mean, you just kind of realize, you know, it's a sport, and you know, that's going to happen to anybody. You know, it's going to happen sooner or later to anybody. So, you know, it's basically for me, it was just a learning experience. I had to just look back, watch the fight, you know, saw the mistake that I made, you know. But for me, I kind of looked at a lot of the stuff that I did right in the fight and kind of pulled all that and just, you know, watching it, seeing the the things that I was doing wrong, just learning from it. You know, I'm implementing it going to implement that into my camp now and uh, really focus on the things that I think are going to do well in this fight. You know, for me, it's, I think the more, part that, that bugged me the most was just knowing that there was one second left, you know, and, you know, being in that position where I had his back and went to take him down and he grabbed the cage, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that one second could have been changed by that grab, you know, and uh, the ref didn't really stop. It didn't say anything, didn't kick a point, um, you know, and, Am I saying that would have, you know, made me win the fight? No, I, I have no idea. But um, I think, you know, things would have been a lot different. It would have made it out of the first. And, you know, for me and, you know, my camp looking at Aldo, he stayed throughout the fight. And so for me it was uh, the goal was to keep the pace high the first, second, third rounds and push him into those later rounds to get that fight slowed and, uh, you know, come away with that W. So, you know, that, I think that's the thing that bothered me the most. But, like I said, understanding the sport, you know, it's part of it. Um, you know, for me, I just kind of use it as a learning experience. Obviously, since then, Aldo's gone on to face Frankie Edgar, Korean Zombie, and Ricardo Lamas. Uh, seeing as that he's already had those three title fights, what were your biggest takeaways from those fights? Um, for me, it's just I feel like Aldo's getting less and less aggressive in every fight. Um, it almost seems like he's cruising, um, you know, and a lot of people are giving him criticism that, He's becoming a boring fighter. Um, you know, he's just kind of cruising, not really looking to finish anymore. Um, you know, I don't know if that's because, you know, he's getting injured so much throughout his training camps. I mean, the guy's pretty much fighting once, maybe two times a year. Um, maybe his body's not able to hold up with it anymore. Um, but, you know, for me, I'm, I'm looking at that. That's that's a hole for me to get in there and use my aggression, my ability to, to stay in a guy's face, use my power and my wrestling to put him down. So, um, that's definitely something I want to be watching for. Now, last time you fought Brazil, um, I mean, last time you fought Brazil, last time you fought Aldo was in Brazil. Uh, this time it's going to be in LA. How much of a difference do you think that's going to make to your fight and to to um, actually get in there and not having to worry about certain things? Well, I mean, I think this is going to be huge for me. I mean, it, it was tough going to Brazil. That was my first time uh, having to do that, especially something that big. I mean, a title fight, um, you know, it was crazy walking out and have the entire crowd chant you're gonna die in portuguese and uh you know the flight getting used to the time change and if you fought like at three or four in the morning Oof. it was just it was it was tough man and uh you know this time we're in my backyard um you know it's going to be easy for me it's about an hour flight uh, you know no time change uh the food's all going to be the same for me so the weight cut's going to be easy um you know, it's just something that I think it's all going to be in my favor as far as the hometown advantage. Um, you know, and last time when, when we fought afterwards, he jumped out and did all the crowd surfing and stuff. And, you know, I was saying, payback's a bitch. You know, this time we're going to be <laughs> in my hometown and uh, it's going to be my time to get in there and put Aldo down and maybe do a little crowd surfing. <laughs> nice. Now, uh, everybody is beatable. What would you say are Jose's biggest holes or weaknesses and, and what do you do better than Jose? Yeah, I agree, man. Everybody's beatable. I mean, especially in this sport with those tiny, tiny gloves, no one can get caught with a punch at any time and go to sleep. Same thing with a knee, a kick, elbow, anything. So, uh, I mean, for me, I think, obviously, I have my wrestling, but I've improved a ton on my stand-up. Now, what, you know, stand-up, obviously, is, is his strong point. So, a lot of people are saying that now that I feel more comfortable with my stand-up, it's just falling more into his game, which is going to benefit him more. But, I look, I look at it like this. My stand-up's better. I can hit hard. Uh, I can put people to sleep with one punch. Now he's got to respect that. Now my wrestling comes into play. I can mix up my wrestling with my striking very well now. So that's something he really needs to watch out for. Um, and also his cardio. I mean, getting pushed in those later rounds with me being able to mix up the, the wrestling with the punching, I can push him a lot harder than I could before. You know, that first fight, it was... Uh, basically, I was 90% wrestling. That's pretty much how I won fights. I didn't really have the stand-up or the confidence. You know, now that Ludwig's been here, you know, we've been training a ton with our stand-up. 
just feel I'm so much more confident in it. I feel like I'm just going to be a lot more dangerous fighter for this guy. Um, you know, I've been hitting hitting uh, strength and conditioning harder. I think put on a little bit more muscle. I was a lot smaller when I fought him the first time. Um, you know, and his size and athleticism is one of the, the keys that he uses for winning. So uh, I think we're kind of even, evening the playing field as far as that goes. And, uh, you know, like I said, I'm excited to get in there and, and prove to the world that I'm the best featherweight in the world. And uh, I'm going to get in there and try to finish him. Geez, Chad's getting bigger. You're already a specimen in the first fight, so uh, you'll probably be looking pretty good in this one. But And stop making us all yeah. feel bad for eating that KFC chicken and, and cake. Every time I watch your fight, hey, my girlfriend kind of hey, looks over at me. Hams, <laughs> you guys have the though. You guys have the Tim Tams. I get so it's even things. harder. I, it's even harder here, though. Oh, I, yeah. we'll send, I love those, by the way. We'll send Jose Aldo a fresh pack of Tim Tams. Not because we like him better, but uh, we'll just give him issues in his uh, in his weight cut. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get yeah, him addicted. Exactly. Send him boxes of them. Now, um, now Jose has said that you know he will be looking for the knock knockout in this fight. Um, uh, he said it in a respectful way, but do you think that he might be overlooking you a little bit, considering um, you know he might think that he's already beaten you once, and this might be a similar story to the first fight. Yeah, I mean, I, I've heard some interviews where he's kind of saying, like, "Oh, I've knocked him out once. I'm gonna go out there and do the exact same thing," uh, you know. And I'm, I gotta say to him, I, I really hope you're not overlooking me and just expecting that to happen again because this is gonna be the toughest fight he's ever fought. Um, you know, this is a new and true Chad Mendez, and you know, I'm looking to get in there and, and test all the waters, push him to the deepest water he's ever been in, and make this a fight. So uh, I definitely hope he's not overlooking me. Now you mentioned um, you mentioned a different Chad Mendes. Obviously, with Dwayne Ludwig around for for quite a while now, um, we've seen Team Alpha Male just improve drastically. I mean, not to oversimplify things, but a lot of the guys people thought were you know very strong wrestling base, and you know we're seeing guys from Team Alpha Male you know knocking people out left, right, and center. What would you? What's something that Dwayne Ludwig has taught you that really stands out and probably made the biggest change in your game? You know, for him, it was. Uh... You know, before, we didn't really have the head coach, first of all. You know, Master Tong was the guy that would just hold mitts for us and stuff, but couldn't really speak English. So, you know, honestly, we didn't have a head coach. So I think that in itself is one of the main things, you know, uh, that's kind of helped the entire team. But as far as Ludwig's style, one thing that we've always done as, as wrestlers is you drill. You, you know, you get there, you warm up, you drill for about an hour over all your techniques, all your moves, takedowns, and everything. But we never did that before. So... Um, you know, Dwayne's having us do a ton of home drills. We're basically drilling, drilling, and drilling all of the combinations, uh, slowing things down and, and really seeing openings. You know, he'll, he'll give you a combo and, and say, all right, there's, you know, these are the three things you need to look out for, you know, hitting this combo. And this, these are different openings that if you throw this combo, they react, you can hit it. So uh, there's just a lot of that type of stuff where he's really breaking things down. And I think for us, that was, you know, huge in everybody's game because we never did any of that. So I think uh, that alone has really improved everybody's striking on the team. And uh, I think you guys could, could pretty much see it in the fight. So um, I think that's probably most important. Uh, now, Chad, uh, you've had some interesting comments about Conor McGregor. Obviously, he robs a lot of people the wrong way. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, what are, what are your thoughts on this guy? You know, I think uh, there's a consensus in MMA. He's had one or two fights in the UFC and he's already trying to, you know, use his trash talk to get into the title picture. What are your thoughts on him? I mean, he's basically just a shit talker, bottom line. Uh, the guy's just trying to get to the top as fast as he can. You know, he hasn't fought anybody in the sport yet. Um, you know, and it's it's his way of just trying to get up there as fast as possible. So um, I've just been ignoring it for the last few months because I know that's exactly what he wants. He wants a reaction. But, uh, I mean, he's just making it personal. And I can't stand it anymore. The guy, the guy's an idiot, basically. Um, you know, you can't just fight one or two guys in the lower tier and expect to be fighting for a title. You gotta fight someone at least in the top ten. And even still, there's few guys in the top ten you need to fight before you even get close to that title shot. So, um, you know, I was just watching a video the other day of him get submitted in the first round. It was, uh, a pretty ugly, ugly fight so it's, <laughs> this guy's you know running his mouth like he's never been beat and he can't be beat but it's like dude you've been beat already twice and they were like nobody's that beat you so <laughs> i don't know what the hell the deal what the deal is with that guy and do you think cole miller will have the edge in this one do you think cole's got a good chance of beating him yeah i think cole has a great chance going out there and, and choking him out you know hopefully puts the guy unconscious i don't know but um 
I, I think he has a great chance to win. Now, before we go into it, we've got a few fan questions for you as well. Before we go into those, I want to ask you about um, the EA UFC game. We obviously recently uh, caught a very, very quick glimpse of you in one of the recent trailers. Tell us about your experience in uh, becoming a video game character. Yeah, man, that's pretty cool. I remember a while back they did all that stuff. Uh, you know, actually, I'm, I'm not really a huge gamer, so it wasn't anything I was ever, like, obsessed about. But it, for me, it's just super cool to be able to... Uh, um, see that I'm in a video game. I have a bunch of buddies that play video games all the time. Some of my buddies have kids. They're younger kids, and they're always, you know, calling and telling me how cool it is that they just beat the game using my character. And uh, it's just something I never, ever growing up would think that I'd have my own video game character. So it's, it's pretty sweet. Okay, now it's time for the fan questions. We've got a few fan questions here for you, Chad, so we'll just quickly rattle through them. Uh, first question okay. comes comes from Fell for next. He wants to know... Uh, what is your walk around weight in the off season? And um, you're big into hunting. What's the craziest, the biggest thing you've ever caught? He's a bit selfish, this guy. Two questions in one. Yeah, so size wise, I get that question a lot. Um, I honestly don't really ever get over 60. I think the highest I've ever seen was about 164, and that was when I broke my hand. And, you know, I could basically do with squat stuff and leg stuff. So I got a little chubby and put on some muscle in my legs. But. Um, yeah, about 158 to 160 is what I usually walk around at. And then as far as hunting, uh, probably, um, I think the biggest thing I've ever got was probably a mule deer that was pushing 300 pounds. Um, you know, I've gone after elk before that are pushing a thousand pounds, but, uh, you know, I was archery hunting for them and, uh, come up short, either missed or something before I got that, that shot off, so. That's probably the biggest thing I've ever gone after. Nice. Now, uh, Junior Sagano wants to know, what's your secret um, on, on doing one-handed push-ups, and how do you do your crazy spinning push-ups? <laughs> Honestly, uh, when we filmed that, I had never really done any of that stuff before. We were kind of just sitting there messing around, and I was feeling a little hyper, so uh, we just kind of started doing stuff. But um, I, think, uh, I think just doing high reps of push-ups will build that explosiveness or even doing the push-ups with, like, the clap uh, will build up that explosiveness to where you can do the, you know, the behind the back and the, the twisty kind of stuff. You know, I, I a lot of the stuff is kind of natural, I think, but uh, I'd say if, if you had to train for it, that's probably the best thing you could do to, to get it get it done. No, Very no worries, Chad. We're, <laughs> we'll just add more claps to our push-ups. We're sitting around here like... Uh, like... Ben Stiller at the end of uh, Dodgeball, but I guess we just need to put more <laughs> in our push-ups. <laughs> now, Chad, uh, S SSK96 wants to know, when I cook my pork tenderloin, it often comes out a little dry. I've tried searing it first before putting it in the oven, but it's still a little dry. He wants to know, do you have any yeah. suggestions for him? Um, well, there's a couple of things you do. You never really want to overcook it, any type of wild game or even if it's not, but overcooking it, uh, always dry it out. You have to make sure it's not undercooked either because you can get uh, sick from it. But um, make sure it's not overcooked. Um, I like to also, you can brine it. You put it in like a salt. You can put like citrus, you know, orange juice, anything like that, salt. Um, you can do any type of the seasonings that you want. And you basically soak it for a day or two in that. And uh, then you can sear it right off the bat and then uh, cook it cook it like that too, throw it on the grill or whatever, but like I said, do not overcook it. That should help. How come you guys ne are never in, like, my kitchen rules, a master chef? You guys would make a great team, like, <laughs> the ultimate cooking team. I love cooking. In, yeah, in the, I absolutely love it. In the kitchen, you need, like, a Gordon Rames, you're like a Heston Blumenthal in your corner. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Screaming and yelling at everybody. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess it's time for the what we call the submission radio tap out round. This is basically for for those who don't know, it's the get in to know you round, Chad. We're gonna fire off a bunch of questions. It's kind of like um, word association, and you just basically answer as, as as quick as possible. Okay. Okay, Chad. Um, another one. This one is actually from the forums. Loyal, loyal sure dog would like to know: uh, Would you rather fight two straw weights or one super heavyweight? What was the first one? Two what? Two straw weights or one super heavyweight? Uh, two straw weights. Okay. Team Alpha Male, uh, favorite chick flick. Now, we asked TJ the same question, and he didn't us give us a clear answer. So what is a Team Alpha Male favorite chick flick? <laughs> um, see, I don't know. 
<laughs> Let's go with the notebook. Ah, the notebook. Come on, chat. Uh, if you're an international spy looking, this is an important one. So listen up to this one. If you're an international spy looking to break out of the evil Russian power plant, do you take the front door and shoot your way out, or do you do a sneaky escape at the back door, hiding behind various pillars and plants? Can I do the sneaky out the back door and then end up sniping everyone that uh, I need to? Sure, I don't know. Do All right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's a Russian power plant. We'll allow it, Chad. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. Now, who's the best at karaoke at Team Alpha Male, and what's their song? Um, I'd say it's Danny, probably, and uh, it's a it's a Thai song, and I don't know the name of it. Master Tong used to, used to sing it all the time. Uh, it's about a, I think it's called Motorcycle. Wow. wow. You'll have to, yeah, you'll have to ask him about it. He'll actually sing it for you too. He's pretty good. Well, we're going to have to get him on the next show. Speaking of Danny, how amazing was it to see him get that KO recently? Oh, that was awesome, man. I, that was a cool one to see. Danny, he works so hard, so getting to see him do that is, it means a lot. Uh, next question is, who's the most annoying person in the UFC? <laughs> the most annoying? Conor McGregor. <laughs> and um, moving on with the tap-out round. Uh, thus far, what has it been a, a career highlight for you? Career highlight, probably knocking out Cody Guida. That, that was definitely a big win. Uh, growing up and watching MMA, who was your idol or someone that you looked up to? Um, actually, uh, Tito Ortiz is someone I, I watched a lot growing up just because of the whole wrestling back then. I was a wrestler since I was five, so that was someone I actually got to meet him at a couple wrestling tournaments growing up, so that was someone I always watched and looked up to. Chad, important question. We always wanted to know, what are your thoughts on mustaches? What are my thoughts on them? Yeah. I, I, I love them. I think they're super cool. That's what we thought. <laughs> if, if, I, if I could grow a good one, I probably would. The kind I would love that you to can, see um, with one. Wax, you know, you wax the ends and then you kind of curl it up. Ian. I don't know what those are called, but those are pretty cool. I think it's unofficially dubbed the Ian McCall. So, yeah. And, and <laughs> yeah, awesome. the Ian McCall. Um, he it, pulled that off so good. I know, right? We tried and we're like, oh, what are we doing with our lives? <laughs> um, any plans on coming down to Australia, possibly to do a seminar at any point? I would love to. I mean, uh, I know you guys got some pretty decent hunting out there, too. I'd like to get out there and, and try some of that. I've been out there a few times. I love it out there. The Gold Coast is beautiful. Mm. Well, we, Victoria's pretty good as well. We're coming from Victoria. But, yeah, we'd love to have <laughs> you down here. And final question, Chad, how are you planning to finish this upcoming title fight with Jose Aldo? Uh, any way I possibly can. And if it doesn't, you know, go to a finish, I'm going to, you know, be all over them. So I, this is this is a fight that I'm definitely obviously not taking lightly. Uh, I, like I said, this is a new improved Chad Mendez, and uh, I'm excited, man, to get out there and, and show the world you know, how much I've improved from that first one and, uh, you know, how excited I am to get in there and do it. Guys, he's the new and improved Chad Mendes. Now with the retractable claw action, he is fighting Jose Aldo at UFC 176 on August 2nd. And in Australia, of course, it's going to be August the 3rd. So check that out. Can't wait. And hopefully we see some LA crowd surfing. Chad, it's been an absolute pleasure having yeah. you on the show. Ah, thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. Boom. So there you have it, guys. Chad Money Mendes. Pump for the big Aldo fight. Another big show. We've got Chad Mendes, Hackleman, John Dodson, and Mike Kogan. It's time for us to say goodbye. It's another episode of Submission Radio. That's right, guys. But before we go, remember, you can tune in to us on Stitcher, TuneIn, and iTunes. And don't forget about our Twitter, at SubmissionAUS. We love to hear your questions for our guests. So keep an ear to the ground and find out who is coming up next week. Also next week, Cass, we've got a big thing coming up about EA UFC. Yeah, absolutely we do. Uh, it is a private uh, press media only experience about of which we will be attending. Uh, it's going to be awesome. We're going to get hands on with the EA UFC game. I'm really pumped. First time it's been in Australia. Uh, so look out for the official Submission Radio AU. If we can, we will get some gameplay. Either way, we're going to have some questions for the executive producers. So send us those questions at twitter.com slash submission radio AUS because we want to answer your questions. That's right, guys. Don't forget to subscribe, as Casper mentioned. But until then, we've got another show coming out next week, so make sure you keep an eye and an ear to the ground and find out which guests we'll have coming up. We'll announce that uh, next week. Till then, guys, it's been a pleasure chatting to you all. We look forward to next week with massive guests. And uh, in the meantime, enjoy your week, enjoy MMA, and peace out, MMA community. See ya.